So I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting of Tuesday, January 12th, 2021 to order. Happy New Year to everyone. I'm glad to be back on uh, the break. I really didn't have too much um, adult interaction time. I had my kids at home and uh, we didn't visit any relatives this year. So <laughs> I'm actually more grateful to be back at work than I, than I usually would be, I think. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, on with the meeting, I'd like to recognize that we're on the traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And I'm going to read Article 23 from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for exercising their right to development in particular, Indigenous peoples have the right to be actively involved in developing and determining health, housing, and other economic and social programs affecting them, and as far as possible, to administer such programs through, through their own institutions. And we'll move on to item B, which is the in-camera recommendation. Move. Move the recommendation. Thank you, Director Grant and Hamir. And that is that uh, we move in camera according to Community Charter 91C and 91E, Labor Relations and Acquisition and Deposition. Is there anyone opposed to moving in camera following the regular meeting? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we're on to adoption minutes. Second. Director Grant and Morin, and those are the regular minutes from December 15th. Is there anyone opposed to adoption? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we're on to petitions and delegations. And today we have uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resources, Operations, and Rural Development. And quite the mouthful, it's uh, Tim Abada and Babita Baines and they are going to speak to us about Gypsy Moth Aerial Spring. Move a seat. Second. Thank you, Director Hillian and Grant. And we have our presenters Yes, online. we're here. Yep, we're here. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, our staff are just gonna bring up the presentation. And uh, I'll welcome the presenters and let them know that they have 10 minutes to present to us and then they, there will be questions, hopefully. Okay. And we'll, uh, Bita will be doing the, the presentation and uh, I'll help along uh, answer some questions. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so thanks for having us. Um, as noted, Tim Abada um, is the uh, Forest Health Officer with Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. And I'll refer to our ministry as Flynn Roard. Um, just to save time. And I'm Babita Baines. I'm the Provincial Forest Entomologist. And just some background, I've, I have about three years of experience um, doing gypsy moth eradication. And Tim has close to 30 years of experience. So he's got a wealth of knowledge and experience, and he'll probably answer most of the questions at the end. Um, so we'll just move to the next slide. Um, so this is just an overview of um, the gypsy moth data that's been trapped across um, or captured across BC. It's our trapping data. So annually, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which I'll probably refer to as CFIA, um, they monitor gypsy moth introductions into BC with the support of our ministry um, by setting up pheromone beta traps um, that, that trap uh, basically uh, male moths. And every summer traps are set up through the province um, and in areas with previous gypsy moth detections or following an eradication spray program, we do set traps up at a higher density. Um, however, across the province, they're just set up on a grid um, looking for these detections. So following the 2020 program, um, as you can see from the left side, um, the Courtney map, um, we did trap five male moths in uh, just north of Courtney. Um, and across the province, we trapped 51 male moths. So there was a high introduction of gypsy moth into BC this summer. Um, and, um, you know, this area in Courtney that 
um, we did detect um, those five male moths. It's in the same area that we aerially treated in 2007. So the ministry treated approximately 210 hectares. Um, and we also ran a spray program in that area um, in 2018, um, where we treated 94 hectares. So those spray programs were probably effective in um, reducing those establishing gypsy moth populations. However, it didn't completely eradicate them. Um, and that's probably why we're back again this year. Um, or there's the other possibility that there's been repeated introductions from the same source. Um, so unfortunately we're back and I'll talk a little bit more about um, just the background of our program and then I'll get into um, the actual treatment area. So we'll move to the next slide. So once our summer mo monitoring program is complete, um, the trap data is reviewed and where establishing populations are identified, the Gypsy Moth Technical Advisory Committee, which includes professionals from the Ministry of Flinroard, Agriculture, Environment and Climate Change Strategy, um, and also professionals from the CFIA and Canadian Forest Service. Um, and in November, we start planning for any identified eradication programs, which could be ground, a ground spray or aerial spray or just um, increased trapping density to monitor an establishing population. And one of the major components of, our, of program planning includes um, engagement with municipal or regional governments and First Nations and public outreach through information bulletins to the media. Um, and then for aerial spray programs, what we're planning to do in uh, Courtney, um, it'll sort of include, uh, you know, postcards that go to households, and we usually send postcards out in January and early April, um, which includes program information. And we also typically hold an open house to address um, any residents' concerns or just to answer public questions. But unfortunately, due to COVID um, restrictions, we will not be hold holding an open house this year. Um, we are also legally required to post the pesticide use permit um, application and then the subsequent issued permit in local newspapers and at local government offices. Um, and we do a number of other um, sort of outreach or communication steps. And these are all outlined in a rigorous annually updated communications plan that's put together by our ministry. Um, next slide. So I guess many of you might be wondering, um, how is gypsy moth um, getting into Courtney or why is it showing up? Um, and unfortunately, we're not really able to know for certain. However, the European gypsy moth is most commonly transported into the province um, from out east where it is where it has established. And this can be through the movement of outdoor household item, items when people move um, via transport vehicles or on RVs. So there are a number of modes of introductions, but we will never really know for sure. Next slide. So do we need to spray? Um, so eradication of this non-native pest, which was introduced from Europe is important considering Western North America has maintained a gypsy moth free status, um, which has allowed the free flow of products and integrity of our urban forests. Um, considering the gypsy moth caterpillars feed on over 300 deciduous trees and shrubs. Um, outbreaks would not only impact our valuable urban forests, but could also threaten rare ecosystems such as the Gary Oak ecosystems, and also impact valuable orchards um, and other uh, agricultural crops. Um, a failure to eradicate would not only threaten um, those values that I just outlined, but it could also result in a quarantine of the infested area by CFIA, um, which would require the inspection of goods leaving the area, plus further import restrictions um, could be imposed by the US. Next slide. So the product we use in our eradication program is uh, known as 4A48B, and it's composed of BTK, um, which is a bacteria that's commonly found in soils, um, plus water, so it's primarily water, um, and inert ingredients. Um, and these are sort of like food grade additives. Um, and the product is thoroughly reviewed by the PMRA and US EPA, and it's also approved for use on certified organic farms in Canada and the US. Um, as I noted, BTK, which is the active ingredient, um, is a bacteria, 
and it only kills the caterpillars of moths or butterflies once they ingest it. And to ensure there are no adverse impacts on native moths and butterflies, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy um, complete a spe species at risk review for us. And if we do identify a species at risk, um, we go through the appropriate measures to either reevaluate our program or to put checks in place to um, ensure there are no impacts on those species. Additionally, to minimize human contact, and again, because this is approved for use over populated areas, it is deemed um, to have, you know, be safe essentially to use over populated areas. Um, but to minimize the contact, we do spray in the early morning, um, starting at first light, and we're typically finished by around 8 or 8.30 a.m. And obviously by our third spray, um, our sprays occur seven to 10 days apart. Um, we're able to start a lot earlier and we're usually done by 7 or 7.30 a.m. Um, also to ensure um, residents are aware of the program, they are notified uh, of the three spray days um, through various modes of communications, which include but are not limited to neighborhood lawn signs, highway signs, um, and our Gypsy Moth News webpage. Next slide. So here I have a map of, um, they're the same map. Um, I've just put, there's the ortho on the right and then just a, um, a, a more general map on the left. Um, the actual spray area is 187 hectares and it spans Island Highway around the Renison Road and Hubbin Road areas. Um, and again, this is the same area or there's overlap in the area that we treated in 2018. Next slide. So again, as I've noted, you know, we go through a number of different measures to ensure as many, you know, there's always one or two residents that maybe don't read their mail or they don't notice the street signs, but generally we do a pretty effective job in ensuring the residents are aware of our program. And that starts with a postcard delivery in January, just outlining some of the, you know, program overview, a map of the area, um, a link to our website um, and also includes a phone number for our 24 hour gypsy moth information line where they can leave us a message and we'll call them back and they can also get program updates. Um, we also complete mandatory advertising in the local papers. Um, plus we um, issue information bulletins to the media and it's up to them if they pick up the stories or not, but we typically do get um, good media coverage with our programs. And as I noted, we also put up signage in the area so residents or people coming in and out of the area are aware of what's happening on what days. Um, and we also have a dedicated Gypsy Moth website um, that has a host of information on the product that we're using, um, the pest itself, and um, program details. And our news page, we have the an option for um, residents to subscribe to our news page so that they'll re receive automated um, news updates as there's program updates occurring. Next slide. So that's sort of a general overview. Um, and I guess now I'll just open it up for questions for me and Tim. Great, thanks so much. I do see we have a director with her hand up, Director Vermeer. Thanks, Chair. And thank you for the presentation um, for both of you. So <clears throat> my questions are, um, just about the, you know, the reason for the spray um, area. If I think it might be easier if we can back up to the the map of of the spray, um, like the the polygon that has the, yeah, um, because it straddles both sides of the island highway, and yet I note that most of the forest is on the east side of the highway. So, could you maybe? explain why um, you've chosen that area to spray um, when most of the forest, and I would think that's where the gypsy moth would be in your present is on, on the uh, east side. Or I can tackle that question. Um, as Bibita noted that uh, this, this insect feeds not, not only tr on trees, but many uh, herbaceous shrubs, uh, a lot of things like, uh, like blackberry, uh, alder, um, a lot of the uh, the species that would be found uh, on the roadside. Um, there are some areas uh, in the on the um, I guess it's the west side of the highway that 
uh, we know our, our ideal uh, hosts. Um, a good chunk of that area obviously is, is not host because it's, it's field, farmers fields, but um, the large area and the lack of access uh, to those spots uh, requires us to use an aerial spray program. Um, the trapping um, grid that was put on there, um, the protocol is to go to uh, one and a half negative traps from the last positive. Uh, and so that standard has been used for many, many years. Um, there's also the same standard that the, the Americans use south of the line. So we have uh, um, harmonization with our, our process um, and transparency when we, uh, we talk about what we do to uh, prevent this insect from, from becoming established. Okay, I have a couple of follow-up questions if that's all right, Chair. Hmm. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, you know, um, and, and I'm asking this as an organic grower as well. I know that there is an organic certified organic farm right in the middle of your polygon on the corner mm -hmm. of Renison and Island Highway. Yep. Um, it, are you aware, because I know in 2018, the last spray, um, my understanding was that 4A48B was not Omri Canada listed and that organic farms in Canada were having some issues with being covered by the um, the spray. So has that changed? Yeah, that. Yes, that has changed. We have the Armory certification. Okay. Um, I, I have corresponded with that, that grower um, in, during, in the 2018 spring. And actually, we did get the certification then. So uh, she was actually okay with the, uh, with the treatment. Okay. Um, so it was, uh, that organic issue has been resolved now. Perfect. Okay. And then just, um, again, I know it's like just slightly outside of the polygon. There is a school um, on off of Hubann Road, mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. outside the gray part of the the um, the polygon. Mm -hmm. So I know the the risk of drift is not going to be huge, but um, for the first spray, if it's going to be around between eight and eight thirty, that is when all the stu students are coming in and school buses are driving through that that area. Um, so just to, I don't know if if notification has gone to the schools or if that's something that you do. Um, yeah, we will be we will be doing that um, prior to um, the treatment. Again, we we're at the early stage. We've just applied for the permit, um, and we've received a permit number. Uh, it, it, we have a thirty day um, uh, permit um, comment period. Uh, once an advertising is published, um, is the, the clock starts on the twentieth of, of uh, January when the um, when the ad is published in the local paper. Uh, and the, so they have 30 days to comment. And then after that, once we get the permit from the um, Ministry of Environment, uh, the, another clock starts when they can appeal the, the um, permit, applica uh, permit uh, issuance decision. Um, so there is a, a, a public uh, input process uh, all along this, uh, uh, this, this whole uh, permitting requirement, and it's uh, established under regulation. So we can't shirk it, and it, but it also uh, provides a, a very tight timeline for us uh, because our biological window is uh, uh, basically April fifteenth is the usually the earliest we would want to go um, based on the development of the insect. Um, often it, uh, and we're not really sure what's going to happen this spring, but if it's um, a, a cool wet spring, um, it could be delayed into uh, maybe the late into the first week of May. So, as the first date, so we don't really know. Um, so anyway, we will have lots of time between now and then to uh, to provide notification. Um, I just wanted confirmation: is the school along the eastern boundary? Is that where it was noted? Yeah, it's the northeast. Northeast. It's outside, okay, yeah, because yeah, outside yeah. of the buffer. We typically do not notify outside of the buffer. Like within the buffer, we do daycares, care homes, um, schools, but we can make a note to. Um, provide um, a notification. And we can also work with our pilot um, to see if it's possible if we start spraying on that northeast side first so that it's completed um, by the time, um, you know, people are moving around in that area. Um, and again, you know, we can ask our pilot and as long as it's safe, um, it should, we should be able to accommodate that. Yeah, that would, I think, really be helpful because, um, you know, over 50% of the students are bused into that mm -hmm. school. So they're driving right through the, the polygon. So if that's possible, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, 
Are there any further questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank both Tim and Babita for coming and presenting and having this dialogue with us today. Great, yeah. and if you have Thanks any questions, so just contact us. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. And is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And uh, before we go on, I, I actually forgot to um, welcome a new alternate director to the board today. Uh, we have Lindsay Floss, Floss say? <laughs> Floss. Floss, okay, thank you. And um, she is the new alternate director for Area A. Sorry. Did you press? Yep. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks for the welcome. Happy to be here. <laughs> okay. So moving on, we are on to reports, and we have the Comox Valley Emergency Program Administrative Committee report. Thank you, Director Grant. Can I get a I second? Did. Director Hillian. And is there any discussion on the December 2nd minutes? And is there anyone opposed to receipt of those minutes? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. We're on to item two, the Comox Valley Economic Development Municipal and Regional District Tax, MRDT program. And Move it, today, Steve. Sorry, thank you, Director Grieve and McCollum. And uh, today uh, we have Bill Angland, who's the chair of Destination Marketing Advisory Committee joining us, and Dina Simkin, the chair of Comox Valley Economic Development Society. Thanks so much for joining us today, both of you. Thank you very much for the invitation, uh, chair, directors. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, from our conversations with um, uh, James Warren, you guys are looking for a little bit of background and information on the um, MRDT program. So uh, with that in mind, there's a PowerPoint presentation that I'm assuming um, is about to pop up on your screens. Yes, staff are just bringing it up. Thank you. And we'll go to the first slide. So this information was presented in May of uh, 2020 uh, from DBC. So it's um, as recent as we currently have. Um, you can go to the next slide. The municipal and regional district tax uh, previously was known as the additional hotel room tax and it, it's imposed and managed under the Provincial Sales Tax Act. It applies to purchases of accommodations in designated accommodation areas in BC. So of which we are one, or the city of Courtney, I should be more specific, is one. MRDT is a tax that's up to 3% of the purchase price of accommodation collected on behalf of municipalities, regional districts, and eligible entities. Uh, when you see the term eligible entities, um, the act or the program has the ability for a DMO to be the eligible entity. And that whether it's the municipality or the eligible entity, they are the ones that are responsible for the filings um, to the ministry in terms of making sure all of the program requirements are met and dealt with in an expeditious manner and that all documentation and reporting is carried out. Currently, there's uh, MRDT being collected in 55 communities. 21% uh, of them are at the 3% rate of taxation and the remainder are at the 2%. This is also important. Uh, the tax is voluntary and it must be su supported by the local government and at least 51% of accommodation providers representing at least 51% of the accommodation rooms. So as hotels or um, different properties enter or exit the marketplace, those numbers are rebalanced and recalculated based off of that. Uh, next slide. This is kind of a, a relatively simple flow chart in terms of where the um, the flow of money occurs. So you can see the travelers pay, um, in the case of ours, a 2% tax to for all eligible tourism accommodation. That money is transmitted directly to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, they retain an administrative fee. In our case, um, you'll see that the flow goes to the left, the defined eligible entity. 
which in this case is uh, the CVEDS acting as the DMO for destination marketing activities. And then from there, the tourism marketing programs and projects. It also, as you see on the right side of the diagram, can be split off and go to local governments. Um, and then you'll see that that little blue dash line, um, that's that additional 1% the difference between the two and the three percent those funds can be used for affordable housing oap and or traditional mrdt um and then uh, next slide please so you the next slide uh, just gives you an idea of the growth um, of the five-year mrdt revenue growth that's that occurs um, those it gives you an indication of the amount of money that's being collected across the province in terms of what it's being utilized for and how it enhances the tourism and the marketing potential that the that each of the communities that utilize it has next slide please the roles and responsibilities and administration so the ministry of finance is responsible for the administration of the tax the facilitation of application decisions they're also responsible for the tax policy and uh, regulation amendments. The Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture is responsible for the tourism policy, the MRDT, TEP, RMI and other funding program alignment. Basically, they want to make sure that all of the funds are in line with the policies from the, from the ministry side. And Destination BC is the primary point of contact. They review the applications and the annual reporting and they encourage coordination and collaboration. We work fairly closely, or in this case, CVEDS works closely with Destination BC to ensure that occurs. Next slide. The key objectives is to make it as user-friendly and easy to access the information. They have a really well-developed website. Certainly any of the directors that are looking for deeper information, both in terms of eligibility process, all of that is contained within the uh, the website. The clarity and transparency is provided through the reporting procedures and the enhanced accountability rolling back through the Ministry of Finance, ensuring that all of the reporting requirements, DCB, um, make sure that all of that is basically uh, taken care of in terms of both work plans and the spends themselves. Next slide. So this is kind of the nuts and bolts of it. MRDT revenues are used to fund tourism marketing programs and projects um, and any other uses listed by regulation. Those are the primary ones. The MRDT, because it is um, collected from a, as a user tax, the function is basically driving it in terms of increased visitation rates. Um, you'll often hear the term beds or heads in beds. Um, so what it is used primarily for is to add to or enhance um, things that are not as well developed as they could be with the ultimate um, goal of driving it to increase tourism. So if you look at um, one of the projects that is these funds have been used over the years is the uh, um, shellfish. Probably the best example um, going from strictly just a small, or a well attended event, but it's relatively small to a tourism and commercial event that had um, week long participation from different groups, all of those people staying in local hotels and generating those kind of overnight stays that, that was ultimately one of the goals. Um, they're defined eligible administrative costs, so you're allowed to charge back some administrative costs to those things. The one thing that you'll see that isn't on here is capital projects. The only time that the MRD funds um, can be applied directly to capital projects primarily is you'll see in the next slide is when it comes to the affordable housing uh, component. Affordable housing was added to it um, in uh, 2018 to give uh, predominantly each community that collects it has, has some flexibility in how they use it. Um, many are using it to ensure that the service sector has um, affordable housing because most of the places where it's in place that actually can become one of the limiting factors for the tourism industry is accommodations for staff and employees. The other uh, primary changes um, 
was uh, fewer than four units is exempt, so it's not required to be collected. Um, online accommodation platforms were added to it um, as it's tied to the provincial sales tax method of collecting. It's more easy to, to track down. And the affordable housing component, as I said, was added in 2018 as well. Next slide. Um, the application requirements and reporting requirements, this was um, brought specifically for us in terms of what it is, but I think it's important to take a look at the application requirements. So the next slide will indicate that you need support and approved uh, bylaw from the local government, which in this case currently under the, uh, the auspices that we're running now is the City of Courtney. Um, support from hoteliers, uh, greater than 51% of the hoteliers and 51% of the units of accommodation. So not everyone has to agree, but it has to be um, a majority. And that's based off of um, the hotels and the units of accommodation. The reason that DMAC exists is the consultation and support uh, from local tourism stakeholders. So there has to be engagement and that's part of that, that process and applica application process. The five-year strategic business plan um, has to outline the vision goals and marketing strategies for a five-year period. Key actions, the key markets and the targets and available to the accommodation sect sector and tourism industry stakeholders. The tactical plan, as you can imagine, is much more um, tight in terms of the tactics that are going to be applied in any one given year, detailing uh, budget performance metrics and refresh targets as they pop up. And those also are available to accommodation sector and tourism industry stakeholders. The 3% MRDT rate um, is often one that we get the most um, questions about in terms of what it is. Um, so once again, the hoteliers have to support um, the tax rate increase because it is voluntary. You can apply at any time. Um, the same ap applic application requirements um, as the 2% tax rate or renewal. Um, you have to uh, provide additional performance metrics in the annual report and uh, they'll sponsor a new provincial tourism events program, which is 0.02% of 1%. So that's where that additional 1% can be spent. The 2% is always uh, marked towards the tourism side of the equation. It's the additional 1% that has some level of, of accessibility. Uh, next slide. So the one-year tactical plan usually is due out uh, November 30th. It, it uh, identifies the activities for next year and expected performance metrics. It's submitted an application and then every year afterwards. The report basically dictates or um, covers off the reporting metrics back for what occurred in the last year's tactical plan. Um, if we decide at some point to go to the 3%, we also have to provide metrics on stakeholder satisfaction survey, community collaboration and coordination on the travel and trade media. The annual financial report uh, is due April 30th and those provide uh, basically to the demonstration of fiscal prudence and standardized format. Um, grand parroted communities submit a five-year strategic business plan every five years and a tactical plan every year. They, there was basically pre-existing ones that occurred before the legislation and they were given the ability to operate under that grandfathered provision uh, for as long as they were basically doing it. So in a nutshell, that is the, the nuts and bolts of MRDT, how it's applied um, and then what its, what its ultimate goal is in terms of uh, providing enhanced destination marketing to drive increase in overnight stays. Um, any questions? Yes, I believe we have some questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, Director Morin, you're first. Great, thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, Bill, for the presentation. Um, I'm curious whether there's been any direction or guidance um, from the province or uh, Tourism BC or, or any of the, the bodies connected with this around the limitations on travel right now. I know that even myself, I had to cancel plans um, just on the island recently because um, 
the 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 recommendations currently are, are to not even leave um, the Comox Valley. Um, and, you know, theoretically, there are people coming into the valley now from the, the rest of the island that that actually isn't recommended. So I guess I'm wondering um, what we do in this time of um, of COVID, which, you know, the deadlines are being extended and we're certainly um, really being impacted by this wave. Um, what I'm just wondering what the plan is around um, uh, the use of the, these funds when we're we're really not supposed to be <laughs> marketing um, people to come and visit here at, currently. Um, certainly a, a valid question, Director Marin. Uh, the the DMAC itself has been repurposed as part of the um, recovery task force. So, in terms of active work from the DMAC perspective. Um, that actually hasn't been the primary focus um, since the beginning of COVID. Um, the stakeholders, because um, the DMAC is a broad representation of the entire sector, both from um, providers, food and beverage, tour operators, all of those kind of things, basically the, the focus for the members of DMAC shifted from the marketing advisory more to um, the the central clearinghouse, I guess, of feedback and and ideas about how to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19. As far as travel bans and promoting, um, that certainly is outside of the purview of DMAC and in terms of how we've basically looked at things. Um, today, I was on a call with the food and beverage um, stakeholders, for example, Dine around, which is one of the things, not tied to MRVT, but to give you an example of, of the, the kind of questions that you have, dine around would be one of those examples where the stakeholders could theoretically um, do marketing because as far as the current orders go, you can have family members attend a restaurant, but they, they feel that that isn't the, the messaging that they want to get out there. So uh, in terms of DMAC, I can't speak to the health orders and marketing a destination. And in terms of, I think the one thing that you just want to be aware of, as you've seen most of the ads on TV, is, is that it's keeping things at people's awareness level. It's not actively um, encouraging people to be uh, traveling in a, in strict defiance of the, the orders that are in place right now. But that being said, there are people that do need to travel for both essential service, whether that's uh, medical, family measures, those kind of things. So the, the industry still has to be able to respond to the need that's out there in terms of how, how people go about it. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I was just wondering if there were some opportunities to to kind of reallocate um, the funds to something that that wouldn't be um, going against those recommendations. So I, I believe, like certainly, that's well above my pay grade. But I mean, in terms, <laughs> you also have to remember that um, the revenue stream has been because it's strictly based off of the amount of revenue that's generated from overnight stays. Um, we don't have the final uh, 2020 numbers, but the expectation is is those dollars will be significantly reduced and the dollars will be um, it, it, when things return to some level of normalcy and when the orders come off, um, you still have to have um, all of the planning and all of the other the activities um, that that go into it. It's not uh, uh, like most things, you can't start it and stop it on a dime. You have to have a lot of the background work being carried out in a timely manner so that when things, whether that's through um, vaccination and, and other options, when that happens again, you have to be ready. And the planning is, is irrespective of what the current condition is, you have to be prepared in, in terms of having that work done. So um, the ministry ultimately dictates um, what is done and how it's done and DBC reviews it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Next we have Dr. McCullum. Thanks Chair and thank you Bill for the presentation tonight. Um, 
Yeah, there's a couple points that came up for me. Um, just I, I, it's an interesting time to be talking about the MRDT because there's just so much uncertainty right now for for travel in general. Um, but I did have a question about um, the November 30th um, deadline for submitting these one year uh, tactical plans. Um, how is that? How are how are we able to address that when um, there's so much uncertainty? I, I just I can't even really fathom what putting together a marketing plan for the year ahead looks like when, um, yeah, when we just don't know uh, when restrictions are going to be lifted. Has the province changed any of those deadlines or are we just dealing with trying to come up with the best case scenario or how does that work? Uh, certainly the the preferred um, resource for, for answering those would be CVEDs themselves um, as the DMO. They'll have much more direct information. Um, that was the one thing when I spoke to James about um, what level of information that, that people were looking for. But um, the, in terms of the reporting requirements, um, DBC and the ministry will adjust them as, as required and they would probably be the best ones to answer your questions as, as far as that goes. Basically, uh, we kind of work along the premise of trying to figure out you can imagine that on a continuous and ongoing basis, um, a tactical plan is addressed in terms of what changes occur. Um, we have the the five year plan, which is kind of the the overarching document, and then we have our um, we're transitioning from the uh, recovery task force. We'll have our first DMAC meeting at the end of uh, this week. And then we'll get further direction in terms of what we're looking at in terms of um, operational metrics that we can use to kind of plan the way forward. Because in the short term, it, there's there's the level of uncertainty is just too too great to to have clear indicators in terms of which way things are going to be heading. But at the same time, based off of the information that's you know publicly available, the hope and the expectation is is that um, as um, all of the measures are utilized and the addition of vaccination. At some point, we're hoping to see um, the, the orders modified and to some degree loosened. We just don't know when. Yeah, fair enough. Thanks. So that was that was a, a good answer for the for the time being, yeah. given the circumstances. <laughs> exactly. um, another question too, uh, just about the two versus the three percent. This is something that I've seen come up um, in various presentations and information along the way while I've um, been serving on council. And it, it, as far as I know, uh, there's I, from what I've heard, there is a fair amount of support for for moving from the two to the three and. Um, can you give us any information about um, if that is in the works or if that's been, and again, this is maybe a better um, question for um, CVEDS rather than yourself, but it, it is actually, uh, if you have some information about it, maybe I, you could share. Exactly. The, the, the biggest thing is, is that at the end of the day, um, it's the fact that it is a voluntary change. Um, so as for basically need to go back to uh, hoteliers and see what the level of engagement is and then also what the willingness is to take that on and then what is that additional uh, one percent going to be utilized for um, all of those things are certainly above dmac they would be negotiations or i guess not negotiations but conversations between CVEDs, um, the hoteliers, and what the road ahead looks like in terms of the renewals, um, submitting the new uh, request, and then working through that process. Great, thanks. No problem. And next we have Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Bill, for your presentation. Um, I was hoping to kind of hear little bit more about DMAC itself and what the makeup of the, um, the organization is, how many members, and would you be able to provide a little bit more information around that? Are you all volunteers? Do you have paid staff? Um, as far as DMAC goes, um, in a general sense, as you can imagine from its name, it's a Destination Marking Advisory Committee. Um, all of the members are, um, there's no 
there's no compensation for the for the board members themselves. Uh, there's no standing staff and no budget uh, in and of itself. Um, the administrative support up until um, Z or until uh, COVID came in, um, all the administrative support was provided by um, CVED staff in terms of um, all of the uh, reporting requirements, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the board itself is basically, it's designed to have broad sector representation. So um, the hoteliers themselves or their delegates sit on it. Um, there's agritourism sector, arts and culture heritage sector, downtown Courtney BIA, marine sector, Comox BIA, restaurant sector, uh, the bed and breakfast industry, um, and then Mount Washington because of, it, of its importance just in the overall uh, tourism um, landscape. Uh, they're also there. Uh, I'm the only one um, on the um, committee that actually isn't a stakeholder and that was by design. Uh, I serve at the leisure of CVEDS. Um, I basically, um, given my background in terms of uh, being a Courtney City Councilor and a Regional District Director, having somebody um, to, I guess, to some degree facilitate the meetings and be um, the arbiter, as you can imagine, um, in an organization as diverse as us, there's to be fair to all of involved, I've yet to see anybody really um, torpedo the process. It, it's, it truly is a collaborative process. I mean, not everything you can imagine looking at our hotel properties, um, say for example, our, our sports um, grant funding to different organizations in the community that wanna put on sporting events to drive um, overnight accommodation. That certainly would, would have, enhance the ability of, of some properties over the other just because of their demographic and who they target to. I mean, um, when a minor hockey team comes, they're going to have a different budget rate than, say, the um, the PGA golf, those kind of things. So, But um, in a room where everybody, to some degree or another, is competing, um, there's been an overwhelming willingness to work together to, to promote the Comox Valley to most of the people fully understand that while somebody might come this time for a romantic getaway, um, you know, at the old house hotel and spa, the next time they come, they'll come with their kids and they might be, you know, mountain biking, they might be, you know, skiing, they might be whatever. So if you, if you look at the the process that we try to utilize is the overall um, benefit is to the entire valley, even though the, t these, the big thing that people often kind of parse is those dollars. The, the MRDT dollars are specific for a, a purpose, and then they can be combined with the agreement of DBA funds or DBC funds to leverage those to give opportunities. But um, for the most part, it's been a really interesting experience um, to, to sit with these people because they are generally competing against each other, but they do see that there's a benefit of working collaboratively together to, to enhance what people think of the Comox Valley when they come and to give them reasons to come back. Great. Um, Chair, if I could have a, just a follow-up question. Um, would you mind just explaining like the the decision making? Like if DMAC makes a decision on like, is that what happens? You decide on a budget item. Does it go up through CVEDS or what is the process? Um, and the reason I'm going to ask is, um, you know, I had some constituents um, e email me um, about a situation about funding to UROC, um, you know, in Cumberland. And i just wanted to clarify like what happened and how that decision-making process um, unfolded. Without the details of the specific proposal that you're talking about, I can't speak in specifics, but certainly in terms of, uh, once again, it's important to understand there's a differentiation between MRDT dollars um, and all other uh, destination market funding, but basically the when the revenue streams are assigned, 
once we're they're knowing what they are, the hoteliers um, give DMAC and by default, I should say CVEDS and by default DMAC, um, the funding envelopes in terms of the allocation of the money. Um, so they can, they can move money around um, from event um, specific to um, broad uh, funding envelopes in terms of where those dollars are going to be applied based off of uh, what they see as the, um, the key drivers in the coming thing. So s some years you might see an increase in um, event attraction or those kind of things. And then that envelope is, once that envelope is set, then that's part of the budgeting process that flows down to destination marketing advisory committee, knowing that we have this amount of revenue available for, um, for different programs and whatever those may be, because the MRDT ultimately is responsible for increasing local tourism revenue, visitation and economic benefit. So those dollars have, for example, I mentioned dine around, Dine around has nothing to do with MRDT dollars um, because the the net benefit of dine around tends to be more local than it would be in terms of overnight visitation or overnight stays. So it truly depends on the specific program, and it it also depends on which dollars and which funding that you're actually looking at. And as far as DMAC goes, those decisions are made um, above it. Um, and then it's trying to flesh out um, operational or tactical plans that res respect those uh, funding envelopes. And then most importantly, and some of the best work that, that we received from CVEDS was its ability to leverage those dollars um, through granting applications to increase the level of penetration of marketing that individually or even collectively, we could never have done by ourselves. So those are the things in terms of um, the budgetary um, that allows it to, to work out that way. I'm not quite sure I understand the, that answer. Um, maybe if, if your hotelier said that we would like to um, support uh, mountain biking because it is a huge draw for the entire valley and people come and stay in hotels um, and to do mountain biking, if that funding envelope was then given, I get, what happens then? There's a funding envelope that goes up to CVETs and then what happens? Is Bill frozen? Are you still there, Bill? Oh, I think he may have dropped. I did. I lost power. <laughs> There's some, something wrong with my uh, um, my power cord, I guess, because I just lost all power. So I just done dialed in on my phone. Thanks, Bill. Did you did you hear that last question? Or do you I did not. Uh, oh. If she could repeat it, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, what I was saying is, um, if the hoteliers, for example. Um, highlighted um, mountain biking as a big um, draw to the valley that brings people to, to stay in hotels um, and wanted to fund, um, say, trail um, development. Um, what would be the process then? How, how would that ask um, go or how would it be fulfilled, I guess I'm going to say? Well, when it comes to any specific things when you talk about that like trail development by definition is capital and as i indicated in the brief um the reality is is those dollars cannot be used for capital projects other than um to some degree the affordable housing components therefore it's not allowed so it's not a case of us not wanting to do it it's just okay. legislatively we're not allowed to okay thanks that clarifies that no problem and next we have Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Bill. Good to see you and Dina. And I'd uh, just like to thank you for your ongoing uh, service to the community in this and many other capacities over the years. Um, 
you're probably aware that there's uh, been some criticism from some hoteliers uh, of um, the process. And uh, I understand uh, um, part of that has been related to uh, a lack of meetings uh, during the past year. Did, did you want to comment on that at all? Um, I'm, it's nice to see you too again, Director Hillian. Uh, as far as it goes, I mean, the, the reality is, is that we didn't meet because the task that was most pressing at the time was the, the recovery task force. So um, each of the sectors was consulted. They were given um, clear direction in terms of um, what they could do to provide a, um, a clearinghouse of information as represented by each of the sectors. And the reality, I, I believe, as, as uh, Director Morin said, the, the shift was, not a, was away from the act of marketing of the, you know, the, the tourism sector in that sense. It was developing resources to ensure uh, an economic sector that is very important to the Comox Valley was able to weather the storm through it. And that was seen to be the best way was through the Economic Recovery Task Force. So the, they became the industry advisors for that process. And through that, they were able to funnel um, different pieces of information to the elected officials because there was some debate about whether we were open for um, travel, um, even at the early stages before anyone was fully aware of how those um, how those rollouts were going to occur. So to, to try and operate as a marketing advisory committee in that environment, I think you have to accept and, and be cognizant of the fact that for many of these business owners, um, their primary focus was survivability, not necessarily spending more times in meetings, as I'm sure the elected, uh, um, the elected officials know when you're involved in this kind of stuff and things go as sideways as they have, everybody wants a meeting. And the problem is, as a business owner, it's very difficult to commit the resources to multiple things at the one time. So we certainly um, recognize that having their input um, for um, industry recommendations were submitted from the tourism sector as a result. And that was the, the best mechanism, best use of the members of DMAX time. Fair point, thanks. Um, the other question I had was, uh, um, I got some information that there's an organization, uh, TVI, that is uh, becoming involved. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned that in your, uh, uh, in your presentation, but uh, do you know what that is and uh, what its engagement is? Um, certainly, it, once again, when I, when I spoke with James, our, our original plan was to have this um, later in the month, but there was a sense of urgency, I think, from some of the directors to, to get a further understanding of the MRDT. Uh, TVI is Tourism Vancouver Island. Um, they have been contracted uh, to provide the DMO services. We haven't had an opportunity to meet yet. Uh, they'll be part of our first meeting with the, the um, switch over back to the T DMAC role on Friday. And we'll be having our initial, um, initial conversations with them. The expectation from, from my perspective is, is they will take over the administrative day-to-day um, -day operation of, of that. Because once again, the DMAC is, the A is, very much a, a part of it. It's an advisory committee. Um, they, it's not the uh, troops on the ground that are implementing the tactics. It's the generals sitting in the sitting in the office trying to come up with the best possible plan. So, how does that uh, the involvement of tourism Vancouver Island change uh, the role of CVEDS? Uh, you'd have to ask CVEDS about that. To be totally honest, uh, Director Hillian. I mean, certainly. Um, on a tertiary level, I'm aware of some of the stuff that, that is being impacted, but from DMAC's perspective, um, it, it actually is irrelevant as long as the provision of service is there, um, whether mm -hmm. it's being provided by um, CVEDS or TVI, 
um, that ultimately is is what the the metric is as long as we're being represented and have the contacts and certainly we as as much as it sounds weird we've worked very closely with TVI um, the entire time the the entire tourism industry is is really built on a layering um, collaborative relationship so you know, the Comox Valley talks to TVI, TVI and the Comox Valley talk to DBC, DBC Tourism, you know, they talk to Canada Tourism. So um, at every level, um, if you can imagine, they're trying to promote, you know, the Canada brand, the BC brand, the Vancouver Island brand, and then the Comox Valley, because depending who your traveler is, you have to have global reach, you have to have national reach you have to have provincial reach and then you have to have you know the hyper hyper local so um as much as it, it i'm looking forward to to the uh to the change certainly all the dealings i've had with tvi in the time i've been involved with uh, dmac certainly they're a professional organization and I, I would not be surprised at all for them to uh step in and and be able to provide us with the level of service that we need to to continue things when and be ready when the uh, the COVID changes um, come into force, whether that's six months from now or you know eighteen months from now, there's still a lot of work that has to occur in the background. Thanks very much. It it it, um, it does somewhat boggle my mind. Um, I, I somehow thought things in the business world were a little more straightforward, but uh, I appreciate that you're there to keep track of it and uh, help explain it to us today. Thanks. Not a problem at all. Thanks for your time. A few more questions here. We have one from the boardroom, Director Grant. Thanks. Hi, Bill. Good to hear from you again. Um, I'm wondering about the... Um, extra 1% that we could use for affordable housing. And I just want to make sure I understand the process because this is a Courtney tax as they're, they're at, it would be up to the city of Courtney council to decide if we wanted to go ahead with that along with 51% of the hoteliers. Am I correct in, am I correct in that? To the best of my knowledge, that is how the regulation is, is written. Um, currently we operate, under the city of Courtney, the properties that are part of the MRDT are all the city of Courtney properties. So properties outside of the city of Courtney do not uh, contribute and aren't required to. Um, so the change would require the hoteliers that are part of it and the town, in this case, the city of Courtney to agree in the application process. Okay. so. I'm no mathematician and I've seen your golf scorecards. I know you aren't either, but um, I, I'm just wondering if we added 1%, I noticed that we collect about 360,000 and 219. I know 2020 won't be as good, but um, so are we looking at about a $120,000 increase with a 1% increase that could go to affordable housing? Am I, am I doing the math correctly there? Uh, I'll trust you. Because like you said, <laughs> hey, I'm a scratch golfer according to my scorecard, but I know yeah. that isn't the case. Yeah, yeah, I know I've seen you. Yeah, okay, all right, perfect. It's just it, there's a good there's a goodly sized amount of money there, and we've got the um, coalition looking for money all the time, and and it just I'm just trying to get a, a handle on the process, and I know we're not part of it because we don't have a hotel signed on, but I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Thanks. Like I said, to the best of my knowledge, that is my understanding of the interpretation of the legislation. Just, um, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I'll just add that um, the hotel tax can be expanded to cover more of the regional district. It could be a regional um, tax that applies to all the jurisdictions within the regional district. There are options for a broader application of the tax than just the city of Courtney. And that in turn with Airbnb and other revenues would, would bring more, more to the table as well. That's true as long as you had the hoteliers that are outside of yeah. the city of Courtney yeah. ag agree. Yeah, um, that's always been, that's been problematic um, in the time that I've been involved with it. That certainly has been problematic. Yeah, I know we've got one hotel in our community. He just doesn't want to do it. So, and my understanding is is that sea beds are 
developing some proposals yeah. to bring forward to you. I don't know the details of that. It yeah. may be the expansion or the consideration of that. But yes, as Mr. Yeah. England says, there will be a, a broader yeah. consultation required. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so just, just to follow up on Director Grant's question, if, if it wasn't um, uh, the regular 3%, but we were going back to those 2018 changes by the province that included the Airbnbs, how would that change the governance, the decision-making process if there was um, revenue being garnered from uh, the Airbnbs? Would it uh, still it, be are, the 51% yeah. hoteliers that make that decision? From from everything that I understand, and and by no means am I a, a the subject matter expert, but basically um, it's fifty one percent and fifty one percent of the accommodations. So the math becomes more challenging, um, but it's a technical question that you'd have to refer to provincial staff because um, that's well outside of my scope in terms of giving you a, a factual answer for you to use for your decision making going forward. But certainly the, 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 um, the ministry staff, they answer these questions all the time and they would be the best ones to give you that answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have two more hands up, Director Hamir. Oh, I don't mind going after Director Grieve because I've had a chance already. Okay, Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Bill. Um, I just want the board to know that at an inaugural meeting a few years ago, I ran for chair and Bill ran against me. And uh, after two uh, tied votes, uh, we uh, drew straws and uh, luckily I won, maybe not luckily for Bill, I'm sure he would have done an exemplary job. Um, thanks, Bill. And thanks, uh, um, I, I just I just want to make a small comment. I don't want to delay the meeting here, but I, I do think that, you know, being on the economic recovery task force and reading all, all the comments from the different sectors and the, the food and beverage sector and, and the hotels, uh, my heart really goes out to our local business owners. We have to remember that the, the money we spend at this board predominantly comes from, well, absolutely comes from property owners and business owners. Um, and, uh, and for us to, uh, to just acknowledge the fact that they are going through some pretty tough straits right now. And uh, we can do what we can do with the limited powers of local government. But I just want you to relay back to, uh, to your group that uh, this board is, uh, is open and, and looking at recovery. I think we looked at recovery last year. It was a little premature. <laughs> We're still in the pandemic. So when this all does clear up, we're going to have to make up for lost time. And I thank you both for donating your time and, and your incredible talents uh, to this, this uh, committee. Uh, thank you very much, Edwin. And, and just as a means of flipping the coin backwards, like I said, we were on a call today with all the, the restaurateurs and, and uh, different supply side uh, questions. And they are a resilient bunch and they're, they're doing everything they can do to to keep um, their businesses afloat. They they're all passionate about what they do. It's the same with the hoteliers. It's the same with all of the people that that I've had the pleasure to work with on this committee. Is is that they they true they're business people, but they they're True Valley supporters and and they want to be here and they want to do the right thing at the right time and and they're you know keeping their powder dry till things improve and they're able to to fully come back to to the the best possible place that it can be for somebody to come and visit great thank you uh director hamir thank you um just i want to follow up on what director grieve just said in, in a comment that you made about um you know our local businesses having gone through through a really stressful time um, and that you were going to be bringing DMAC back together again. So I, I'm, I'm just a little bit concerned that you, you know, you were mentioning about um, the capacity of, of folks um, to give, you know, on an advisory committee. Um, could, could you just explain how people are appointed to DMAC and, and whether or not there might be some support needed to find new members or, you know, folks who are maybe um, on a professional level working more on the recovery side of, of COVID 
is so yeah if you could just explain that and if there's something we can do to support um you know finding finding folks to to help and, and sit on dmap the original process was um basically that dmac was was um the members were um assigned from the hoteliers and then the sectors um there's been no one to the best of my knowledge um that is unable to do it it's just strictly a transitional phase between the um economic recovery task force back um uh, to the more the um, marketing advisory committee kind of thing, because when when the switch occurred, there was a huge unknown. Whereas, to some degree, and you know, cross your fingers, your toes, and everything else, um, that the light is starting to shine at the end of the tunnel. But uh, you know, there'll be a discussion on this as part of our um, part of our work going forward, and part of that one year planning process. So it'll be a chance for us to, um, to go forward because we'll, we'll do a one-year plan and then the five-year plan, and then we'll have an opportunity to gauge you know, where people are at and what, if any additional resources we need. I think you know, the, the reality is, is at this point, no one really knows if full recovery is you know, months out, years out, or, or where that is. And I think to, it's premature to try and build a rock solid locked in five year plan because, um, for example, I'll go back to that dine around meeting that I had today. Originally, the plan was to roll things slowly out um, in the coming spring. As the orders have been extended and extended, you get to a point where you have to reach a you know drop dead decision dates on whether it makes sense to continue down a road that we're not quite ready for. So um, I'm extremely hopeful that in the upcoming conversations through DMAC, we'll be able to better ascertain if there's gaps, if there's a, an additional need, uh, what those might be, and whether or not the, the original supporting document needs to be modified. So um, that's, I guess, the best answer that I can give you, Director Amir. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think we can empathize with the challenges of, of trying to uh, organize destination marketing in a time of constant, uh, you know, uh, changes to uh, the landscape from provincial orders. So uh, that's that's the thing. I mean, like, really, when we look at a five year plan, we'll be looking to that plan will definitely be focused on recovery strategies because um, we're going to have to do some things to to. Um, spur that recovery it's one thing to get past it it's another thing to to build it back to to where it was so i from a personal perspective i think that's probably where the bulk of the focus would go to for that five-year plan is is strategies to to aid in the recovery thank you yeah i don't see any further questions and so thank you both so much for joining us today and uh, for your patience and answering all our many questions. Not a problem. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. Okay. And is there anyone opposed to receipt of the delegation? Hearing and seeing none. That's carried. And we are on to item three, which is CBED's 2019 financial statement and auditor's report. Move for seat. Thank you, Grant and McCullum. And I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Corey Vanderhorst is here today, who has undertaken the uh, the audit. Uh, he will present his findings. And in support of Corey, we also have uh, John Watson, I believe, is on the line from CVEDS and Mariah Ford, your CFO. Thank you to the chair uh, and Russell and, and to the board for uh, inviting me here to present today. Uh, as Das real fast, I'll, I'll go through some of the financial results. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so you've got a, a copy of the 2019 financial statements for CVEDS um, in your agenda there. Uh, you know, with the pandemic, one of the many things that gets pushed to the back burner is audit. Um, not always the most important thing to get completed. 
um, when there's lots of other uh, moving pieces. So we did complete the audit uh, in December. Uh, the board of CVED signed off December 2nd, 2020. And, uh, you know, in lieu of the usual routine where we get to do a, a public AGM and, and have attendance and, and questions, uh, the, the staff requested that we uh, come and present them today. Um, so I'll take you really quickly through the uh, financial results for 2019, again, bearing a uh, reminder that 2019 has no pandemic in it. 2020 is, uh, will look very different um, when, when that uh, gets completed uh, and when those financials are ready. Um, but at a really high level in 2019, um, CVETS had uh, total revenues of uh, $2.5 million. So the uh, 1,265,000 of local government funding through the agreement with CVRD matched by another 1,244,000 of source funding, uh, MRDT, which you've just gone through, and other provincial grants. On the expenses side of things, uh, total expenses of 2458000 um, So the, the revenues and expenses um, from 2018 to 2019 had increased by about uh, 10 to 15 percent on both sides. Uh, for 2019, the core service expenses, the, the operational day to day, um, was a million 281. Uh, and then the initiatives and contract services that are funded by those other source revenues, the MRDT and the provincial grant fundings, uh, a 1 million 176. So at the end of 2019, a small surplus of 51,948, which represents about 2 percent of the annual revenue. So Really close to a break-even year for 2019. Uh, on the balance sheet, uh, the society is managing assets of just over five million dollars. Most of that being the visitor center, uh, four million eight hundred sixty thousand dollars of value on the books. That is a uh, um, an original cost depreciated over time. On the liability side, eight hundred seventy-four thousand nine fifteen. Uh, plus deferred capital contributions of 2.8 million. So that represents the funding from the federal government uh, and other funding uh, bodies when the visitor center is being constructed. And that is also amortized over time. Uh, so what you're left with as a residual is a net asset position uh, of about 1.3 million, which really represents the residual interest in the visitor center. The value on the books minus the um, debt and deferred contributions that were received to fund it. Um, from a cash flow perspective, uh, ca a small cash outflow from operations of $11,000, about half a percent of the revenues, uh, paying the demand loan on schedule of $60,000, a small amount of equipment purchased, uh, $1,026, and then an increase in the bank indemnities of $72,000 uh, on the line of credit to fund the demand loan payment um, and the, uh, the $11,000 outflow from operations. So that's all the detail I want to go through on the 2019 financials, um, but I do believe you have a staff report there. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if I can, um, although I may defer to staff or to CVETs uh, if it's something I can't answer. Thank you for your report. I see Dr. Hillian has a question. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Corey. Good to see you. Um, I was just curious, um, the um, initiatives uh, are quite a large sum, uh, 900,000 I think is the, the budgeted amount, uh, over a million is the actuals. Would you not normally um, expect to see some breakdown uh, of initiatives or is that uh, in an accounting practice, is that uh, acceptable as a category in and of itself? Thank you, Director, uh, good to see you too as well. Uh, good question. Um, on the face of the income statement, that level of aggregation is, is allowable. Um, what I would point you to is in the schedules in the back, um, there are several schedules which break out the details of, of what's in those projects. Um, I think there's seven or eight schedules there um, between operations, initiatives, and other projects. And that's where that detail will be found. Yeah, I do confess I got a, a bit worn out looking at numbers after uh, a few pages. Uh, so, good, good. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Corey, for the uh, the presentation. I was um, just a little bit curious about the sort of the scale of the accounts payable, which uh, it's gone down a bit for, from 2018 to 2019, but it's still almost $280,000. Um, 
I just is that is that common for um, given a balance sheet of this size that 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 much would be owing at any given time? Uh, thank you, Director Paul Hamilton. Um, what you're seeing there really is is, and it actually does tie back to MRDP and some of the types of events that are being held and the timing of those events. So if you think back to 2018 and 2019, you're having um, the Winter Bites festivals and some of those types of uh, December or January festivals, which would have large tables uh, coming through at that point. So it's more an element of timing of the some of the bigger events than it is uh, necessarily an overall indication of the society's activity. So would it be likely that given that the Winter Festival I'm not sure when it last happened, but it was a few years ago, given that it, it obviously didn't happen in, in uh, 2020 or 2021, that we'd see those accounts payable uh, decrease fairly significantly, like in, in the 2020 uh, statements when they're available? I, I think that's a, a safe assumption, a safe estimate to make. Um, we haven't looked at December 2020 yet, but with some of those MRDT funded or, or more event type things not happening in 2020, Yes, uh, quite likely you're going to see a big swing in that account payable number. Okay, and I just had another question. That I'll see the Florida other folks. So just noticing that the um, the the sort of the, the the line of credit had roughly almost exactly doubled from seventy three to one hundred and forty six thousand between twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen. Um, is that part of a, a fluctuation that goes on sort of throughout the year? And um, do we happen to know where it's uh, where it's currently standing? Um, on the second part, uh, I would defer to CVED's uh, staff for where it currently stands. Um, it, the, the increase there from 18 to 19, the majority of that is debt payments on the, uh, the demand loan, um, which has, has been a, a, an ongoing um, uh, you know, uh, piece of, of financing for the society to be winding down and paying down on schedule. So I'm misunderstanding. I thought the, the payments on the demand loan were a fixed amount each year and they didn't change. They are. It's, it's $60,000 a year. And if you look at the increase from 73 to 145, the majority of that is essentially paying down the debt with some of the, uh, paying down the demand loan with some of the line of credit. Okay. Um, so, all right, and and uh, and, we're, and I guess the the current state of things will be. Will, I, I guess if anyone's in the room from CBETS who might know, but otherwise we'll be seeing the twenty twenty figures shortly to get a sort of an an, a, an update on where that stands at this point. Um, all right. Uh, I have maybe have a couple of other questions, but I'll just uh, cede the floor for it because I'm sure other people have questions as well. Thanks. Thank you, Director. We have Director McCollum now. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation on these financial statements, Corey. Um, my first question was along the same lines of just a little bit of concern around um, the fact that um, cash flow was highlighted in the staff report and that it's um, increased. Uh, I mean, I, I recognize we're looking at some numbers that are pretty out of date at this point, but um, short-term debt uh, nearly doubled in 2019, but um, revenues were up and wages were down. And I'm, I'm curious uh, if, if um, there's a concern about running out of available credit. I, I feel more concerned now that um, you mentioned that, we, uh, that the society has basically used its um, line of credit essentially to pay um, its demand loan. Uh, is there a lot of available credit? I mean, I noticed in the financial notes that it's essentially the same um, interest amount. So it, in that sense, I don't think it's um, as concerning, but um, how much available credit is there on this um, operating line of credit? Uh, thank you, Director McCollum. Uh, that's a good question. I'll defer to staff on what they currently have. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, important to know what would currently be in the cash accounts uh, as opposed to um, again, something from, from a couple years ago. One, one other thing I want to mention, and maybe we'll, we'll provide a bit of uh, clarity to, to some of the discussion here. If you look at the accounts receivable number from 18 to 19, that's also almost doubling. So what you're seeing there is uh, large amounts still to come in. 
um, which then means the society was forced to use some of its line of credit as it waited for those amounts to come in. I know that's about two or three months of MRDT funding because it's generally on a two or three month lag from when uh, when it uh, passes through the province and then back to CBEDS. Um, uh, and then there's some other large grants that were available. So you, you kind of have to look at all those things together. Uh, the fact that the, the receivables were higher. Um, so the society was forced at December 31st, 2019 to be in its line of credit. Um, that's always the other, the other caveat is we're looking at a snapshot of one day. Um, I, I think CFED staff would probably be quick to point out that throughout the year it fluctuates. Um, and uh, I think at some point we will get reporting on where it currently sits. Yeah, uh, thanks for that clarification. I guess my main concern is that there's like over $400,000 of short-term debt and I just want um, a little bit of reassurance that we're not getting close to um, a situation where um, the society isn't able to pay its um, bills, especially because we're kind of working in the dark here with what's happened over the last year. And there's been, as as it's mentioned in the notes of the financial statement, some, some big impacts that's happened after December of 2019. So um, it would be very helpful to know. A, I, I mean, there's a note that um, that some of the preliminary audit work has started for 2020. I, I imagine that someone's had a look at, at what the balance is on that on that debt account. So um, it would be helpful to get a sense of if things are a, a little bit more impacted or if they've gotten significantly worse. So um, I don't know if anyone can help me with that question, but that would be appreciated. Yeah, um, um, because I know it has more current information than our 2019 audit. Through the chair, if, um, it's my fort here, if I can speak up. Um, we did meet uh, over the Christmas holidays uh, with Corey from MMP, um, the Comox CFO, as well as with John. And we, we did do an overview at a high level of some draft financials to the end of October for CVEDS, just so you can get an idea of what activity looked like. Mm -hmm. And the cash position had um, gotten quite a bit better. I believe the balance was in the positive of the 200,000 range. So swinging from sort of a line of credit position over to a cash positive position. Um, part of that was related to some grant monies that they were able to obtain through the North Island College programs. So There's a couple of pilots that were flowing through um, events that they were gonna collect a portion of so that put us in a better position for that, or for CVEDS. Um, so I think it really depends for CVEDS on their activities and what type of activities and sort of the timing delay. A lot of their activities is through MRDT or other grants. So there's sort of a timing of when they pay for those activities and when they receive those funds. Um, whereas some of these grants are actually front loaded. They might be in a positive cash flow position. So it really, I think their cash flow position as far as sort of looking and talking uh, with John, it, it does fluctuate year over year and actually between you know, throughout the month. So um, they did, they were looking positive as at the end of October. I'm not too sure where they are at this point or sort of going into the end of December. Um, if John wanted to sort of add to any of those comments. Um, but I think to, you know, in those discussions, I think the visitor center and that sort of demand loan has always been sort of a bit of a cash pressure uh, is what I've sort of understood um, over time and sort of looking within, you know, that demand loan payment as well as ongoing operations of, as a, of the visitor center um, can be challenging sometimes with sort of all the other programs they have going on. That's very helpful. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I, I do think it's reassuring just to see that there's not a continuous downward trend on that line because, of course, we only have the, the two comparables. So um, that's very helpful. Thanks. If, um... If it does help, uh, I don't know if uh, through the chair and Myra and Ori, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Uh, those are really good comments being made. Um, the MRDT is a challenging one, uh, especially when it compounds year over year. Uh, there is a timing item related. And of course, um, the fund when it does come, comes monthly. So, you know, it's sometimes difficult based on expectations and how campaigns run within the tourism sector at the destination marketing organization level to, to uh, be able to simply pay on the month on the cash flow basis. So we've had to use um, funding, for example, a January event that may be um, someone mentioned uh, winter bites or one of the older uh, après ski winter festivals, but those can be incredibly expensive to run. And so 
you know, with the January MRDT as a contributor to that process, that event uh, you wouldn't see revenue for easily two, two to three months. And, uh, and when it came, it would be based on January revenue and January occupancy in hotels is very low in the community. So you can see that we've been under a leg. However, from an operational perspective, um, this is recognized by not just the Destination Marketing Committee, but the hoteliers. And a year ago, uh, without knowledge of the COVID, um, we took efforts to, to slow down expenses, to reduce expenses in the, in the early part of the year, uh, in particular for that winter festival, so that we could save up a bit of a surplus to start alleviate this process. And um, you know, with COVID and the deferment of provincial taxes by the province, uh, that too has uh, complicated this year. More on that when we uh, present the 2020 audited statement. Um, but uh, to the point of the line of credit, uh, it's a zero balance and uh, we should be looking fairly good towards the end of this year uh, in regards to Myra's comments. Um, so anything else on that, I, I'm happy to add and, uh, and uh, pleased to be here. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, that does actually bring me to another uh, question just about the accounting on the MRDT. I noticed that at the end of 2019, it was in a deficit. Is that just reflective of the society having to guess at what um, the revenues are in advance of spending them? Or how does, how does it end up in a deficit? It looks like it was partly um, carried over from the year before. Yeah, we have to uh, we have to estimate the final years uh, when we're dealing with uh, MRDT and of course prepayments um, that occur in uh, in a given year towards the end of a year uh, that are for the the preceding or the next year um, that deferral payment item has to be dealt with. Uh, so we have in every year sometimes uh, you end up with a you know a, a deficit from what was budgeted. Um, you don't know that until you get the final. Uh, the final numbers in from the from the province. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll uh, hand it off to somebody else for more questions and let it come back. Thank you. And thanks, John and Mariah, for the clarification. And we have Director Hamir next. Um, I'm not sure who to ask this question to. Maybe first to Corey. Um, you know, just picking up on the comments that uh, from um, Director McCollum's uh, questions about uh, having to dip into lines of credit um, for an organization this size. Um, is there any kind of recommendation for like capital reserves, um, or you know, is money just so cheap that you dip into a line of credit? Um, you know, coming from, you know, the regional district where we're quite strict on what kind of amounts of reserves we have. It, you know, I, I sort of echo Director McCollum's like apprehension when you start to see, you know, a lot of borrowing to cover, um, you know, all of the payments that have to go out. So, you know, is there a recommendation? Um, I don't know if there's a percentage or some kind of buffer that an organization this size should have as a just general accounting kind of recommendation? Thank you, Director Vermeer. Um, it's a great question. You know, the, there's no magic number when it, when it comes to sort of those cash reserves and cash balances. Um, in my experience with the not-for-profit organizations that I work with and, and, and see that the, uh, the not-for-profit society um, is it's very common for there to be no reserves. Um, and the, the budget, you work the budget and you end up with um, either a small deficit or a small surplus at the end of the year. It, it, it's very common, um, regardless of, of um, whether it's economic development or childcare or housing or some of the other organizations that we work with that um, there's an extreme reliance on government funding, uh, whether it's provincial or local um, or, or, or even federal for, for some of the types of programming that's out there. So um, again, no magic number. It would be not, I would love it if the nonprofits that I work with could squirrel away rainy day money, but it's not common from what I see in practice. Um, and I think what you're seeing is the limitations of those funding agreements. Um, the funding agreements are not gonna allow an organization to put money aside. Um, and if it does have any uh, that was unspent, it's often required to spend it in the next fiscal year or give it back. So there's all the incentive for an off-profit organization to spend it all. 
um, depending on agreement by agreement. Okay. Um, um, yeah. well, maybe for Mariah then, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we ask for any funding to be returned if it's not um, spent from the RD. Um, mm -hmm. So any comments from you? Um, through the chair, Director Hamir, I think that's something that we're going to be taking a greater look at um, through 2021. So um, as we work to sort of collaborate more on the finances, look at shared services with CBED and CBRD, um, working more closely with John and his team, I think we'll take a look at sort of overall cash flow management in the budget projections. Um, I think operation, that's a, you know, that's a good point and that's sort of something I flagged when I looked at the financials too, that sort of line of credit position. It did give me comfort when we're moving to more of a positive. Um, by the end of 2020, but I think too, like, what does that long-term view look like and how does cash flow management work with sort of the nature of their activities? Um, how do we put ourselves in a good position? I think, you know, typically for the local government, you know, looking at a reserve policy for operational cash flow management, sort of a two to four month um, sort of buffer in a reserve is a, you know, for mi risk mitigation funds or cash flow management funds is a good approach. So I think we could take a look at that as sort of a baseline. Um, and then as far as the but the capital piece side, you know, something that we've been talking about with John is through the asset management work, you know, it's noted in the contract on the visitor center, uh, we're planning to do quite a bit of work in the next year to two on CBRD side for asset management planning. So we've talked about including kind of the visitor center and that review and really taking a look at what the facility condition is, um, sort of what the kind of, you know, short to long term re um, requirements are to maintain that facility. And I think through that, we'll sort of look at, at our funding strategy for CBEDS moving forward. I think that will really help. I mean, it's it's operated through an independent society, but I think, you know, ultimately we're providing services to the region and we want to make sure I think all of our service, all of our services are sustainable. So uh, that's sort of where I thought we would go if the board was supportive of that. And um, we haven't, the board hasn't seen the activity plan for 2021, have we yet? If I'm just trying to recall because I'm just trying to think how you know that your last statement um, impacts you know the amount of work and the timing of that work if if we're trying to keep that reserve and not spend a lot of upfront money um, mm -hmm. in the months when we know that there the funding hasn't arrived yet how that impacts the work plan um, moving forward so um, a question to Mariah then do you have um, a chance to see those two, you know, piece documents and kind of line them up. Is that something you'll get access to? I believe so. Sorry, so talk sorry to... if I could oh, start. Talk. Tonight's discussion is about the uh, 2019 audit financial statements. In fairness to CVEDS, um, they are working on the work plan and we'll be presenting that to the board at a later time. Sorry to interject, but it, yeah. an hour and a half into the meeting here, and uh, there is some further reporting that will be provided to by CVEDS in the future, possibly to get at some of your questions. Sure, thank you. And, and you don't have to answer that question. It's a, it can be for future. Thanks. Dr. Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a line I was trying to understand what it might refer to, which was, um, destination and product experience wages for just over a hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, could you tell me what, what, the, what that would be, Corey? Thank you, Director Columbus. Are you, can you um, tell me which schedule you're looking at? It's on, uh, it's on schedule eight, I, I believe on, on page, yeah, schedule eight. So on page um, 28 of the report. Um, yeah. just, thank you. Thank you. I see it. There. Yes, hundred and four thousand eight seventeen, um, and eighty eight seven eighteen. Um, and I, I think I would I'll defer to CBET staff on that question for the details of um of those wages. Um, we've got lots of projects on the go. I think John would be able to give you a better answer. Thank you, and thank you, John. Yeah, no worries. Uh, great question. The that would be titled, those are wages, and they're titled as per the MRDT and um, and Destination BC co-op grant uh, budget line items. So they, they describe the tourism staff in uh, different in different ways, and Destination Development uh, and, and Product Experience is uh, tourism's way of, of looking at some of those uh, titles uh, with, uh, within the organization. So it's merely reflecting on the tourism staff. 
Okay, thank you. And, and would that be related to um, just all of your events generally or to um, Guinnesses and Schedule 8? Or would it, um, would it be across the board, all, all activities or, or just in, in any particular area? It would be it would be the amount of funding going towards those staff or FT uh, relating to tourism activities. Okay, and I, um, I think I might have asked about this in a previous year. Is there, uh, is there any possibility of just understanding? Uh, like I know that one of the great sort of uh, showpiece events is uh, is Seafood Fest, and do we have a sense of just for that festival itself, like what sort of the kind of revenues versus expenses? Like I see that. Um, Consumer shows and events are six hundred and sixty-six thousand as a line item on that on that page. Would that be primarily um, seafood fest? Primarily, yes. Uh, the events, uh, basically, since the inception of the MRDT, the Destination Market Advisory Committee has uh, prioritized in the tourism sector, and more broadly, has prioritized the development of events in off season. Uh, in provincial tourism language we call, we are required to report on marketing spending that reflects uh, dispersion. So trying to uh, motivate and secure visitors and travelers in, in obviously off peak times. Um, so for example, we're, we're looking at a winter January um, event uh, of some type um, to uh, to try and drive that uh, overnight accommodation at that time. It's of course very difficult to hold any type of, of outdoor event uh, in, in the dark uh, in the winter in January in the Comox Valley. It's a little different um, up on top of the mountain. But, um, but the events are uh, very much a, a high priority. And of course the Seafood Festival as a signature one was built, I think it was mentioned in the last presentation, um, at the request of the of the destination marketing or advice of the destination marketing committee and hoteliers from a one night uh, event uh, which wasn't driving overnight stays to a 10 day um, event that uh, secured substantive uh, overnight stays turning June from kind of a very poor uh, occupancy level and MRDT uh, remittance uh, perspective to probably something more like a July or or, or August, which were the, the Valley's kind of key months. Um, so so that's, that's where those funds go and they go to any number of items. Uh, remembering of course that a lot of these events are also um, uh, securing funding through external sources. So looking at uh, sponsorships, ticket sales and, and those types of normal things that would occur in, a, in, in these types of events. Right, thank you. I noticed there was, uh, I think, two hundred and ten thousand dollars in in uh, sponsorship and and uh, and ticket sales related to the those uh, those events. So that sort of sets sets off against the six hundred and sixty six. All right, uh, thanks, John. I appreciate your answer. Okay, looks like we have one more question from Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just another question about. Um, the service itself and how funding is secured. There's um, a note in the staff report um, that just highlights that um, of the 260,000 um, received in provincial uh, grants, um, that some of it is only available um, to the society um, because it functions independently from local government. And I'm wondering if um, staff can expand on that at all. Uh, is that the bulk of it or is it um, the odd piece? Um, it would just be helpful um, to know if, um, if that represents all of the provincial funding or just part of it. Through the chair to Dr. McCollum, um, I mean, at a high level, a lot of the grants flowing through CBEDs are sort of not-for-profit specific and they are, they would be involved in a lot more activities through economic development and tourism activities that we wouldn't normally be involved in and, and sometimes um you know it, it depends on the grant there are some that we could be eligible for there are some that they really look to not for profits um so it really depends on the grant activities i think with cvid scope and activity and engagement with the community even north island college they're they sort of have their finger on the pulse too about potential opportunities um so i think that's just something to be mindful of 
that they are able to access funds that we wouldn't normally be able to access either in uh, either they're ineligible or just that we wouldn't normally have that kind of finger on the pulse for those sort of funds. So, you know, they are able to maximize some additional funds that we wouldn't be able to, you know, I, I can't give you a specific number or um, portion, but just sort of something to keep in mind is that they are, a, they are able to take sort of those funds that we provide them and sort of leverage, leverage those um, to create other funds. Um, thanks. Uh, I, I suppose my follow up to that is that it, it appears that the bulk of that um, 260,000 um, lands in the destination marketing um, under Schedule 8, which I assume is, I, I'm not 100% clear because I, I do find it um, hard to kind of sift through these various schedules, but I think Schedule 8 is a representation of the initiatives line from Schedule 6, although maybe correct me if I'm wrong, if I assume that incorrectly, but it appears that 203,000 of the 260 are, is, um, is lands in destination marketing. And um, I'm curious if that's destination BC dollars that is um, available to local government, or if that um, is, falls in this other category that you're speaking of that are um, more application grant based and needs a little bit more, um, you know, feet on the ground to really um, access those monies. Uh, thank you through director, the chair, Dr. McCollum. I think I'd have to refer that sort of detail to, um, to John at CVEDS. I'm just sort of getting familiar into the details of their activity. So um, I think as we work through, you know, this over the next few months here, I'll, I'll get a lot more familiarity. Um, but just, I know when we met um, sort of over Christmas break, Clive and I were both sort of like, wow, you know, you sure undertake quite a bit of activity. So um, I think as I go through, I'll have more understanding of the specifics of it. And I don't know if Grant wants, uh, sorry, John wants to speak up a little bit more of the details of the grant activity that they um, undertake, but I know I was quite um, impressed. Thanks. Well, thanks for that. Uh, just to follow up on Myra, thank you for that, Myra. Um, the, uh, grants are, are different. Every single one is different. The majority of the grants that uh, Director McCollum is asking about are DBC co-op grants. They're designated for um, uh, typically for destination marketing uh, by the designated entity for that particular organization. So it really, you know, to be honest, um, the, the probably where they wouldn't be available to local government is if local government had a, a, a destination marketing organization model that was um, run by uh, a private agency, a uh, private company. So that, that's where I think that the, the real question is. Um, many of our colleagues across the province uh, operate destination marketing organizations uh, both directly and indirectly um, via uh, via local governments, uh, regional districts. So, so it, 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 these particular grants um, would be available in those circumstances. Um, but the the idea that the society has access to to uh, certain grants and certain opportunities that may not be available to the municipal or regional district is is in fact a you know a real case in certain circumstances. Great, thanks. That was that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, we are still on receipt of Corey's presentation. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Director Grant, can I have a second? Second. Director Grieve, thank you. And the recommendation is that we receive the financial statement from CVEDS for December 31st, 2019. And it's a vote of ABC, Courtney Ann Comox. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? And seeing and hearing none, that is carried. Thank you so much, Corey and John and Mariah. Oh, you're staying for the next item. Okay. <laughs> so we're on to item four, the audit service plan for uh, year end, December 31st, 2020. Move receipt. Second. Thank you. Julianne McCollum. 
Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, while Corey puts his other hat on, and that is the auditor of the Comox Valley Regional District, I'll introduce him, and uh, he will be discussing the audit service plan for the Comox Valley Regional District. Thank you. Yeah, here again. Um, I, I, yeah, I, in the interest of time, and I know there's been lots of discussion. I, I'm not going to go through line by line. It's, um, it's uh, exciting stuff. Functionally, uh, basically the same audit plan as uh, what you have for the last four years. Um, a few things to highlight uh, in the pandemic, we will uh, basically be limiting the amount of time that we are on site. Um, we're doing as much as we can remotely. Um, we use our secure client portal um, to share information. Um, we've been working with uh, Mariah and the rest of the team um, to uh, make sure that we get what we can get digitally. Uh, and anything that we need to see uh, physically, we, we set up a, a safe workspace at the um, regional district offices, um, limiting access, wearing masks, all the things to, to keep our team safe and to keep your team safe. Um, we're, we're following all of the regional district protocols as well as our own. Um, the other item there uh, of note is uh, there is a new accounting standard coming for something called asset retirement obligations. Um, one of uh, a, a small bonus in the pandemic is the implementation of this standard was delayed for another year. So regional district staff have another year um, to look at this. Uh, it's potentially a significant project. What it involves is going through all the physical assets being managed by the regional district, looking for um, are there remediation requirements, are, are there legislated uh, you know, from the Ministry of Environment or other contract that say you have to return the site to its natural state. So we're concerned with uh, landfill, with uh, wastewater treatment, with all those types of um, facilities that the reason district runs um, and what will be what the staff will be doing is identifying those um, liabilities uh, going through an exercise of calculating what is what the cost going to be of decommissioning uh, or restoring the property what's the timing look like we know for some uh, some pieces of property that's 30 40 50 years off and some of it might be two years from now so there will be uh, uh, we expect a large adjustment to the financial statements uh, as staff works through that um, exercise and and uh, applies it. It's a, a few years off. You're not going to see it till 2022, um, but it's coming uh, and it's something to be aware of that uh, it's going to um, soak up a fair amount of staff time in the finance department. Uh, it's going to need some engineering expertise uh, for calculating, you know, what does it cost to remediate or, or decommission plants and things like that. Uh, so not a small project and I know it is on staff's the radar for sure. I've had conversations um, with them about it. So um, it's just something to be aware of. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any about our audit plan uh, for the 2021. I don't see any questions. Um, I was just wondering about the, um, the new accounting standard, the asset retirement obligation. Um, what do you think um, was the driver behind that? Um, yeah. I, I just asked because I, I, I've been to um, uh, a few asset management um, um, sessions and I know that a lot of municipalities are, are quite behind that um, asset management game in general. So adding this to it, I, I think is, um, is gonna be pretty tough for a, for a lot of municipalities. So I'm just sort of wondering what, what the driver was behind it. Absolutely. Uh, a great question. Uh, there's sort of two things going on at, at the standard setting level. Um, the guys sitting in Toronto that make all the rules uh, for, for um, local government. One of the things has already been dealt with uh, in a section on contaminated sites. So that looked at inactive sites. If you had an old landfill no longer being used, or if you had a decommissioned public works yard, and what would the cost be to clean it up? So the, the idea there is finding hidden liabilities. What is the region district going to have to pay for at some point in the near future or the, you know, or a long time from now that is unavoidable, right? Uh, on a landfill, you eventually have to do something with it. You either have to close and cap or put in a recapture uh, facility um, or some sort of remediation because you can't let the, 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 you know, the 
to leach it out into the, the neighboring community. Um, so it's this idea that at some point, the reason district will have to pay for it and uh, we'll have to do something. Uh, so the contaminated sites covered inactive, not in use. Uh, this asset retirement obligation now scopes in all the assets that you are using. Water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, um, anything that needs to get cleaned up. You know, you, you go out to some of the some of the communities uh, in, in the valley. Um, used to have old asbestos pipes where water was flowing through them. Those types of things needed to get cleaned up. Um, and, and there are regulations from the province, from the Ministry of Environment. Every province has different regulations. Um, so of course, it's not very comparable across the country. Uh, but in BC, at least, you'll have comparability with your neighboring region district of the liabilities that are going to get shown. And then the, what it does is it, it lets you build it into your asset management plan um, to look at, okay, not just when do we need a new recreation center or a new water treatment plant, but how much is the cost of, of decommissioning the old one or retrofitting? Um, so you, they, they do go hand in hand in these projects, uh, but unfortunately, 100% agree with your, your comment that it adds work. Um, it adds uh, time and effort from staff. There's the potential to need to go outside of, of uh, the region district to, to hire external engineers um, to look at some of the decommissioning costs and make those calculations because um, some communities don't uh, have that expertise in house. So there's definitely a, a cost to it. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, when the standard setters sit down to do uh, these types of projects and to um, impose these accounting standards uh, on uh, the communities, their goal is that better information lets you make better decisions. Um, and so they want you to have all that information when you start looking at asset management plans and five-year capital plans and all those types of things. Great, thanks for that explanation. Okay, we're on receipt. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And I think we can say thanks to Corey for both presentations. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a good evening. Okay, we're on to item five, which is the Comox Valley Water Supply System Budget Amendment. Second. Director Grant and Foss, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And uh, there is a report on the agenda with a recommendation here. Basically, this is a cash flow matter. It's just not an increase in the costs, but it's just when the costs are being realized. Staff are available to answer any questions, but don't have a presentation for you. Are there any questions? Okay, is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Move the recommendation. Second. Thank you. And it's a vote of the areas and Courtney and Comox. Is there anyone opposed to the recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you. And we're on to item six, CBS grant application proposal for the sports center upgrades. Check. Director Grant and Hillian, thank you. <laughs> I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much. And uh, CFO Mariah Ford will just uh, give a bit of background. We just wanted to explain this grant program generally, not rehash what the uh, commission had previously considered. So Mariah will provide some background. Thank you through the chair. Um, so we wanted to provide an update to you on this new grant that was announced in early December, uh, the COVID infrastructure grant. Um, and it's really focused on asset management activities and ensuring you know, anything we're applying for has that sort of long range sustainability focus. So if we have good plans in place and condition assessments, um, we don't typically see sort of a facility based grant uh, stream. It's sort of something new, you know, recreation facilities were included um, fire halls, different things that we don't typically see. So we took a, a look, we're allowed to apply for one regional or one sub-regional um, application. So we really looked within our team about a potential opportunity um, for alignment to the grant, but also to 
making sure that we are ready. They're lo really looking for some design shovel ready um, application by the end of January, and also to ensure that the work can be done by the end of December of this year. So it's quite a, you know, they're really wanting to move ahead quickly on this. So through our internal team, we decided that the um, most suitable grant would be the Sword Center application because of the recent assessment we undertook in the fall um, of last year, and also the significant the significance of this application. You know, we're looking at the requirements of the grant and they are asking us to be mindful of the size of application we do put forward. So we will really be taking a look at that um, and being mindful there's only $80 million, which I'm sure many will be applying for. So um, when we come back to you at the next meeting, we'll fine tune that. Um, but wanted to put this before you for our consideration and ensure that we're on the right path. So when we put a resolution forward to you at the next meeting that there was no surprises that you agreed with sort of our approach. Uh, we did look as well. We are able to apply for EA grants. Um, so we did as well take a look at that. Um, we didn't identify any sort of relevant grants that we could apply for that were sort of shovel ready. The categories were the building retrofits, active transportation, and sort of COVID infrastructure improvements. Um, so that we didn't have anything of significance that was sort of shovel ready um, that we identified through Parks and Trails. Um, we are currently looking at sort of a fire hall improvement grant um, and sort of seeing if there's any we can identify through that. Uh, but grants do take time and resource to do and there's quite a quick turnaround. So um, nothing sort of been identified at this point, but we might come to you with an EA grant application for the next coming meeting. But really for the regional grant, making sure that the board supports the path we're on and the commission earlier today did support that application, but wanted the board to as well see sort of where, where we were working towards with this one. Great, thank you. And I see uh, Edwin, uh, Director Greve, your hand is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've never heard of any grant funding for fire halls. Is this something new? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, they've never been funded. We were quite surprised as well through the chair director grieve up to see fire halls. I mean, typically emergency response is not something that they fund. Um, but I think it's it's with that lens of sort of that existing asset replacement. If you're moving ahead on sustainable services, um, do you have designs and studies in place? So I think again, we're seeing these grants really drive us to making sure that we're sustainable and we're planning ahead and we're investing strategically. Um, so. Yeah, so it was quite of a, a new area that we haven't really seen before. Astounding. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't see any further questions. Thanks for the update, Mariah. And I think two hours in, we'll, we'll uh, have a break. Um, we'll take 10 minutes, so we'll come back at um, 6.13.
Yeah. Okay, 613. Hopefully you've all had your comfort break and a bite to eat. <laughs> So we now are moving on to item seven, which is the Indigenous Relations Report 2021. Move your seat. Second. Director Hillian and Hamir, thank you. And I will pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And this uh, report is provided at your direction. And I'll refer to uh, James Warren to provide you a summary and answer any of your questions. There's a series of recommendations that follow. Thank you, Russell, and good evening, directors. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to present today this uh, Indigenous Relations 2021 staff report, um, in part to acknowledge the leadership the board has provided through 2020, uh, the good work that's been undertaken over the past year, and to lay out plans for the coming year. <clears throat> also to introduce the Statement of Reconciliation and a recommendation around some federal legislation that has currently been tabled. So this report built on the existing uh, CVRD's Indigenous Relations Framework, um, and it, it specifically names some of the real actions the CVRD is taking towards reconciliation and working with our Indigenous partners. Some of those actions in 2020 included uh, a, a recreation program offered in the summer in partnership with Watche Friendship Centre, uh, the regular leadership meetings that we've been fortunate to have with Comox First Nation Chief and Council, where we discuss key projects and, and advance those considerations. And then as well, the, uh, the, the work done on the seal Bay signage project to see new signs and incorporate language from Comox, the Comox perspective. Uh, in 2021, we're proposing uh, a number of activities and, and projects. And just briefly, uh, there's some internal training proposed for elected officials and staff around cultural awareness. There is work to understand and integrate the cultural heritage policy that the Co-op First Nation recently uh, unveiled in, in late last year. As well as ongoing, there are community to community forum events where um, the leadership from the CVRD and, and the municipalities come together to work with the uh, Co-op First Nation Chief and Council on various topics. One event is being planned for late February, early March, um, with a goal to look at the application of the declaration, the declaration on Rights and Indigenous Peoples Act, the provincial legislation, at a local level. Um, and then as well, there is plans in 2021 to develop strategies around mid and long term activities for implementing the framework and advancing reconciliation further. The staff report recommends a statement of reconciliation, and it's a I think it's Appendix A in the staff report, and it it helps set the set the stage and guide some of the activities that the CPRD would be undertaking uh, around Indigenous relations going into the future. It establishes a baseline and commitment and themes around reconciliation, and uh, but it does recognize that actions do speak louder than words. And for for that, I would reflect back to some of those proposed activities in 2021. And finally, the staff report does also provide uh, uh, a suggestion or a recommendation around advocacy for this board to take, and that is that is to encourage the federal government to follow through with its uh, current legislation that's on the table, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, um, enshrining that, that declaration into federal law. So, Madam Chair, if you have any questions or discussion, I'm, I'm pleased to, to offer help. Great. Thanks so much, James. And we have Director Hillian. Thanks very much, Chair. And thanks, James and staff, for um, a very thorough and uh, thoughtful report. Um, just two things that I, I wanted to uh, ask you about. Uh, uh, first, uh, I wondered if uh, you thought about uh, adding our um, observer status at the treaty table as an activity that uh, we take part in. Um, that wasn't mentioned. I, I don't know if there was a reason for that or if it just didn't occur. Um, so I wanted to ask about that. And then the other question I had was that um, our, uh, neither our framework nor the statement uh, makes any mention of um, off-reserve or Métis people. Um, and um, I know that uh, we've been engaged with Wache, uh, as mentioned in the report which um, obviously um, provides services for off-reserve people. But I wondered if, um, if that was a deliberate omission or if, there was a, um, if it was an oversight uh, 
that we don't uh, seem to mention uh, either of those uh, uh, categories of Indigenous people. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Hillian. Uh, with respect to the treaty table and the observer status, the that certainly wasn't an intentional omission, and, and you're right, that is an appointment the CVRD board has made uh, for the last number of years, and so it, it could very easily be reported as activity from 2020 and, and future works for 2021, and we can we can make that that uh, mention on our, our website. We have our Indigenous Relations Framework on the website, and we were planning to incorporate these, this report and some of the work in 2021. So we can make that note uh, uh, on, the, on the page there for sure. Thank you. Um, with respect to the, the lack of reference to Métis or off-reserve in the statement or the framework, um, it, it, it's not intentional to omit those references. I think that um, Indigenous Peoples is meant to be comprehensive. And so um, rather than rather than trying to get too specific, I believe we took a more broad approach to, to reference Indigenous Peoples. Uh, I think there's, there's yeah. Yeah, the, the reason I bring it up is because, um, you know, we do talk about Indigenous people, which is obviously very general, um, but there's a lot of specific mention of our relationship with um, Comox First Nation. And I think there's a reference to um, perhaps other uh, nations uh, through the, um, uh, the waste management uh, um, area that we serve. Um, so I, I just thought that uh, given that we do have an active Métis association in the Valley, and um, we actually have more Indigenous people living uh, in the community who are not affiliated with Comox First Nation than otherwise, that uh, it may actually be worth uh, finding some language that recognizes that. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Good, good comments. And certainly the, uh, the proposed statement of reconciliation is, is um, here for your consideration. And if there is value in expanding that, we can, we can look for that language. Thank you. Director Morin. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to bring up the um, off-reserve folks as well, so thank you, um, Director Hillian, for that. Um, I, I wanted to say there's, you know, there's work being done, I think, um, on, on kind of a broader level around um, advocacy for uh, First Nations folks and, and others that are impacted by discrimination, et cetera, and I wondered if there was a way to weave um, weave that into into this um, into this document, um, and the reason I say that is I know Councillor McCollum at city at the city had um, proposed an equity and inclusion um, uh, resolution a couple of weeks ago to embed into our strategic planning, which is of course kind of overarching. Um, many, many groups that, that may experience um, racism, discrimination, bullying, harassment, et cetera, in the community. I just think that it would be great for us to embed that kind of message that, um, and that also translates to action when we um, hear of incidents that happen, uh, that we reach out to our, um, the Friendship Center and KFN and other groups to really show that um, that this behavior isn't tolerated and that we take a stand against it. And I did bring, at the risk of being, being repetitive, at uh, last night's council meeting, I brought this up as well. And I also bring this up due to our staff. And um, I know just on the water project alone, we, we had a lot of um, First Nations um, employee or First Nations folks working on that project and I and I'm sure that we have some really great um, you know policies that many employers have around um, you know not tolerating um, racism all that kind of stuff in the workplace but I think if we were to make a bolder kind of statement and really show our um, people that are working on our projects whether they're contractors or um, or our, our direct staff that that you know beyond uh, what's in this document that we we look at this in a in a really holistic way and we um, and we support um, the the things that they um, take a stand against the things that they may experience in the community and advocate 
for them whenever we can. So I don't know if that makes sense. I know it's kind of an abstract um, explanation, um, but I believe that we could do something that um, that maybe addresses that aspect on a more broader community basis, but also looks at our um, our own staff and employees. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Martin. Um, I, I I do know that with the water treatment project, and, and Mark is here if these if if there's something to add. But I do know with the water treatment project, we have a a, a strong partnership and agreements with Kamloops First Nation around um, employment and opportunities. And so I think that 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 does address some of those opportunities for the for the partnership side. Um, on the statement of reconciliation piece as a document, I, I should also say that this is one more piece of a foundation that, that we build towards reconciliation. And there's there's no one uh, step that will resolve. This is about continuing to build build the foundation and and add pieces to our our relationships and, and developing reconciliation. So. Um, if, if today were a point in time where the statement were approved, it would be then built upon as we as we go through time. The uh, the concept of the midterm and longer term actions to be taken to implement the the framework also would build upon the statement of reconciliation, and we would I'm sure this board would probably want to revisit the statement over time to to add to it. So um, so these are these are all yeah I appreciate the comments being provided by Director Moran and others. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, uh, there's quite a number of articles within um, UNDRIP that speak directly to anti-discrimination. And I think so as, as we're adopting um, uh, that legislation, we will be able to, um, we will be able to address the, those issues um, as we're incorporating that into our policies. Uh, Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think rather than rush to get on the bus here, we have to rethink this. I will be uh, putting forward a, a motion to refer this back. I think that uh, in my experience that uh, my First Nation friends are not necessarily um, uh, Metis or our true First Nations. They're not necessarily from our, our local uh, a local Comox First Nation. I would point to Courtney where my good friend Doris Wiseline, who's, uh, who's a freeman of the city of Courtney, actually hails from Manitoba. So I, I think uh, in, in light of all these uh, comments, it's important for us to maybe review this and broaden it out a little bit. I realize that uh, we're trying to do the right thing here, but I, I think we have to broaden it out and include uh, other people of, of uh, First Nation descendancy that have been left off this uh, report. So I, I and also uh, I think we, we look no further than the, uh, uh, the Comox Valley Community Justice uh, uh, Society and, and their uh, critical incident protocol language to, to get some of the language we need to make this happen. So I would definitely defer this back for more consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was staff's intention that it remain broad as Indigenous peoples. And uh, for that reason, um, that we're not uh, listing out um, specific people. Is there any further comment? Okay, I think we are still on receipt. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. I wonder if given uh, um, a couple of the suggestions, um, how staff might feel about, um, about us um, moving on recommendation three, uh, but uh, pausing a little bit on uh, recommendation one and two so that uh, some slight amendments could be made in, with, with regards to those. Thanks, I think. Um... <clears throat> The recommendation three, I think, is fairly straightforward. So I think that would be. Um, I, I didn't hear much discussion against that recommendation. Um, the statement of reconciliation is really meant for the board to to consider and approve. And, and I do take a couple of points about broadening out the, the language around Indigenous peoples. Um, 
so so it would be the board's discussion on on whether to proceed as is or to refer with a bit a bit of instruction and then on on recommendation two around the activities planned i i, I don't know that there was much discussion on those activities i i think there was some some support for that so um i guess this rests with the board in terms of the next steps yeah, would the board consider um, passing it um, just uh, with the addition of staff um, looking into a broadening of scope of uh, Indigenous peoples? Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely a little bit confused because I'm not sure what the broader term would be here. Like I, I'm I think I'm losing um, the thread of the um, discussion a, a bit, and perhaps um, Director Grieve could just um, expand because um, I, I I thought it sounded quite broad and inclusive the way I read it, and and maybe I'm missing something. So um, maybe we could just have that expanded on because um, I think I'm missing something. Thanks, Director. Yeah, I think it's not clear for staff as well what what is requested of them. Director Grieve, do you want to speak to that? Thank you. I just think we've heard a little bit around this table today that uh, this speaks to maybe revamping it and giving a second thought. So I leave it to the board's discretion, uh, but um, I can certainly uh, support moving ahead with recommendation three as was suggested by Doug Hillian. Thank you. Okay, maybe we could hear a bit more about how the board would want to revamp it. Director Morin. I think maybe part of the confusion, to me, the, rec the first recommendation does uh, is inclusive. Um, it's broad enough in that language, but I think maybe because our some of our activities um, that have already occurred and also some that are pre um, presented are a little bit more specific. That might be why there's, um, you know, why there's a bit of uh, confusion there. Um, so maybe, um, maybe we just need to have something that uh, recognizes that, um, you know, in the in the details of of the document that that recognizes that it's beyond. I mean, not specifying it's beyond KFN, but but that it's inclusive of, um, of other projects. Um, you know, that it's, that it's included inclusive of, of everyone. I'm not sure, but I think that's maybe where, where it's coming from because some of the activities are more specific to um, particular groups. So maybe there's something that we can put in. Okay, thank you. So more in relation to recommendation two. And Chair, Chair Kettler, if I could. Um, so <clears throat> Appendix Appendix A in the staff report is the page and a half proposed statement of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And it is certainly intended with, with reference to Indigenous peoples to be inclusive and, and, and encompassing. Uh, the statement does recognize the CBRD's boundaries spanning the traditional territories of many First Nations. Uh, and then it goes on to speak to the four uh, recurring themes, self-determination, shared prosperity, protecting cultural heritage and the relationship with land and water as some of those um, focus points for reconciliation. It is, it is meant to be a, a piece of the foundation for the CVRD in moving forward. Appendix, appendices B and C are separate and not meant to be attached to the statement of reconciliation. They're separate in that they speak about the activities in 2020, some of the specific work that was undertaken and the proposed work plan for 2021. So, so there is meant to be a distinction between those three documents, if that helps the, the directors. Thank you. Director Hamir. Thanks, Chair. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have any problem with um, the actual statement in, in Appendix A. I thought it, it was, it was broad and um, as staff mentioned, you know, it, it's a, it's a starting off point and um, I would like to kind of start 2021 on a, on a good um, foot and, and have something like this in place. I'm also though in in kind of similar mind to Director Morin about um, 
doing more, but I'm not sure if this is the, the place for it. Um, so maybe for the other directors to consider, um, you know, a broader either statement or for consideration in our future strategic planning. Um, I do think with certain events that have happened in the regional district um, and in you know, the municipalities over the last six months, um, a broader inclusivity, diversity and um, statement that um, ensures that yes, our staff and um, everybody who lives and works um, in the Comox Regional District, Comox Valley Regional District is uh, made to feel that they're welcomed. But I don't know if that's, um, I mean, it's broader than just Indigenous people. So I'd, I'd like to work on that something separately. So I think, you know, for now, I am comfortable with recommendation one and three. I guess the question for the action plan then for recommendation two is um, what else could be added that would um, sort of help rectify, you know, other groups not being involved? I mean, we do have the work that we're doing with Wachie. So I'm just not sure if staff or, you know, if there are suggestions of where, um, what, what could be done that's in the purview of, of the RD. So I don't know if that's something that um, directors could provide now or if that's something to be referred and followed up with. Um, to do your first point, Director Hamir, I think um, we are, as um, James had stated, planning training, um, both of board and staff. So um, maybe um, a statement of inclusivity uh, can arise out of, out of that. Um, and uh, as James also stated, this is sort of, you know, first steps and, and uh, a living document that we will be building on. Um, so uh, that opportunity is, is still there for us. Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't want to overthink this. Uh, uh, for me, the, um, um, the resolutions could all be passed if, uh, if we simply um, uh, add the items that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, I, I agree that uh, I think D Director Hermir's suggestion that, uh, or perhaps it was Director Kettler, I'm not sure, that um, a resolution could arise out of the uh, some of the training that uh, that we do. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, in relation to uh, the discrimination issues. But um, I, I do just want to say that uh, I've been approached uh, on more than one occasion by people, uh, Indigenous people who live here, uh, who have mentioned the fact that uh, there are more uh, Indigenous people from other nations in this area than there are members of the Comox First Nation. And um, we also have a Metis Nation. Uh, we raised their flag uh, recently at uh, City Hall, um, which is a tangible gesture. I think if, if we at least mention um, <coughs> the diversity of the Indigenous population with the specifics of the Metis Nation and, uh, and other nations uh, living off reserve, um, then, I think the framework is, is excellent and, uh, and we can build from there. So, um, you know, I, when, it, when it comes to, I, I think we should receive the report. And then when it comes to uh, the specific rep recommendations, um, I would simply ask that staff, uh, that we pass those with the understanding that, uh, that staff would uh, make those um, suggested amendments. Thank you, Director. Uh, Director Grant? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that, <clears throat> I believe we're still on receipt, but I was going to suggest that we pass these. And because this is a changing document, that we could either add those now, as Doug suggested, or they could be added in the future. And, th and that way we could get off to a good start, get this rolling, and not get it lost in the minutia of government where we could we could move it ahead. And, and I think we'll end up right where we want to be if we do it that way. Thank you. Um, maybe I will uh, call for a receipt at this time. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Director McCollum. Uh, I, I, did, I wasn't opposed to receipt. Um, I just had my hand up to comment, but I can, I can comment when we get to the recommendations. So I'm good to pass for now. 
Okay, I'll assume that everyone's good with receipt and that passes. And go ahead, Director McCall. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe comment more broadly on this. Um, I thought that the staff report was excellent. I thought it was um, really great to review all the good work that's been done in the last year, see the context of where we're at currently and what, what actions we can take looking forward. Um, I also just wanted to comment that um, while we were uh, on our break, I saw um, tonight that Surrey City Council voted down a land acknowledgement, um, which is pretty depressing at this, this point in, in this day and age. And um, while I recognize that we can always do better and that there's room for adjustments and improvements, um, I think we need to uh, recognize that we're doing good work here and that um, these recommendations are um, inclusive as they're written and um, that this is, this is um, continued good work from uh, the staff that uh, we work with and the direction that's being set by the board. So I'm supportive of all the recommendations and, um, and of course we're always adapting and improving as we go forward. So those are the comments I wanted to make. Madam Chair, point of order, we should move this uh, recommendation to make the comments. Okay, um, Director Cole Hamilton, do you have um, comments on recommendation one? I do. I, I do, so I'd be happy to move it so we can begin a comment commenting on that. Could that be of assistance? Yes, thank you. Cole Hamilton and Grant have moved and seconded. Go ahead, Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you. I was just thinking of the the, the idea of more inclusive language, uh, and uh, I know that that that'd be an issue which came up when um, I was back in December when I was drafting the letter to the the, the, the board about um, adopting UNDRIP, and the the language that uh, Jake Martins came up with was just to be building better relationships with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and that seemed to be a very succinct but widely inclusive. And while Indigenous does encompass all of those, all of those groups, I think, um, I think perhaps just listing them and stating the diversity might, um, that's language that possibly could be included at the end of, uh, of resolution one, if we were to amend it, recommendation one. So as a, as a suggestion. Okay, James, did you get the wording? for that? I think so. I heard uh, Director Cole Hamilton building better relationships with uh, Indigenous peoples, including all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. The, the language in the letter itself, I'll just read it, is to build better relationships with all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And I guess... Uh, That's fine. Yeah, thanks. Great, we got that. Thank you. Can... If that's a, an amendment, I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, so we have the amended recommendation one. Is there any further comments? It's a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. Thank you, we're on to recommendation two. Second. Oh. Yes, it was under recommendation one as amended. I think we, that was the understanding. Um, so on to recommendation two, did I hear a mover and sector? I think it was Grant and myself. Director Grant and Hamir, thank you. And Director Hillen, you have comments? Thanks, Chair. Just a suggestion as made earlier that um, the uh, treaty table uh, uh, observer status be added to the, um, the list of activities. Uh, I, I don't think it needs to be a formal amendment. I think uh, if, if staff are, are supportive of it, uh, we, could, uh, we could deal with it that way. Yes, James is nodding. He's added it to his list. Thank you for that. Is there any further comments on recommendation two? It's a vote of full board. Is there anyone opposed? 
Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we're on to recommendation three. Second. Grant and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And I think that uh, we had discussion on this earlier. There didn't seem to be anyone opposed to encouraging the federal government. So it's a vote of the full board. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. We're on to item eight, regional transportation. Move for seat. Second. Thank you, Cole Hamilton and McCollum. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Mike Zabarski is here to uh, present this report and, uh, and answer any of your questions. Actually, if I, if I can, sorry, Russell, I'll, I'll just introduce Mike and then Alana. I, oh, are you on? I'm sorry, so I didn't, I didn't yeah. let you know that that was part of the plan. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. You're Actually, you're right, you signed off on this report now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Russell, and thank you, Directors. So, in September, the board conducted its strategic planning session and it named transportation as a core service. Um, some of the service objectives, the key service objectives for transportation that you described included citizen mobility, greenhouse gas reduction, caring for vulnerable populations, addressing poverty, and finding alternatives to gas-fueled vehicles. Today's report describes transit as a major component of the Comox Valley transportation formula, as well as the considerable work projected through the considerable work that is, is being undertaken through the regional growth strategy. Mike Zabarski and Alana Mullally are both here today to describe those aspects of the transportation file and, uh, and we're all available to answer any questions that you might have following. So Mike. Thanks James. To the uh, chair of the board. Um, so as you know, uh, 2019 or 2020 was a very difficult year for transit and affected transit riders uh, significantly. We did see a fairly large reduction in, in ridership and revenue, but I'm happy to uh, note that those are recovering fairly well. Um, we are also quite lucky this year that we've been able to realize some cost savings and uh, receive some fairly significant funding assistance from the province and the federal government to offset the revenue loss with public transit. Uh, that includes about $900,000 over two years as part of the Safe Restart funding program. And because of these savings and, and financial assistance, we're not expecting any kind of shortfall in this year or, or I guess in 2020 or 21 for that revenue loss. Um, in order to receive that restart funding, the board needs to approve the annual operating agreement for last year, which we've just received. Uh, we also need to maintain service levels and limit any kind of fare increases over the COVID recovery period. Moving forward, the board also needs to determine service levels for, for the upcoming years. Staff are recommending 3,000 additional service hours for the conventional transit system to address the 5th Street Bridge rehabilitation project. This will maintain existing service levels during that period. And after 2021, those uh, 3,000 hours would be used to increase uh, service frequency on, on route number one through the kind of denser core of, of the Comox Valley. Staff are also recommending that a 600 hour expansion be approved for 2021 and beyond to address a service gap in the back road area. This uh, expansion would, would provide a uh, much better transit service throughout the uh, Comox First Nation IR number one area of the community. Both of these expansions um, are within the dollar amounts that were previously budgeted for in 2021 as expansions had already been contemplated and budgeted uh, for this year. The 3000 hour expansion um, would be done in conjunction with the uh, transit priority measures that are identified by the city of Courtney in their, in their draft traffic management plan for the Fifth Street Bridge project. So the combination of the transit priority measures and the extra service hours is required to maintain service levels for transit riders. If these transit priority measures are not implemented uh, during that project, uh, we're suggesting to defer the, the expansion uh, until afterwards as the any extra transit trips would be just stuck in congestion at that point and, and probably not very effective. 
and, and we're very optimistic that the expansion and the transit priority measures will be implemented and be an attractive option uh, for those that are typically maybe a car user and, and we can kind of get them out of their car and onto transit during this uh, Fifth Street Bridge project uh, to help ease congestion. And with that, I'll pass it on to Alana. Thank you, Michael. Through Chair Kettler to the directors. Building on the work that you did in the fall of 2020 on your strategic plan, um, staff have started to put together a series of initiatives that we think will help us all begin to think like a region and set the conditions for regional thinking around transportation. So in the report, we've identified a couple of projects that you're familiar with that we have underway. Um, and we've also suggested some work that we'd like to um, undertake for you in 2021. So I'll begin with the pieces that we have underway on the regional transportation um, file. Uh, you'll recall the work of the Integrated Regional Transportation Select Committee and that the term of that committee came to an end in late 2020. Uh, one of the really important culminations or outcomes of that work was the development of a memorandum of understanding and that's currently out with uh, member municipalities and the Ministry of Transportation. The school district is also named as a party to that agreement and they have signed. The, the meat and potatoes of that memo, MOU, pardon me, are to continue the communication that we you know, have at various levels on regional transportation issues among all of the parties to formalize that work under the regional growth strategy in order to give us some resources, some dollars and staff time to put towards thinking about and acting on regional transportation initiatives. So that is underway. Uh, we are also, as you know, we were the lucky recipients of a grant to prepare a regional active transportation network plan. We are pulling together a project team that includes uh, municipal staff, school district 71 staff and ministry staff. And then we've also pulled together a broader uh, group of stakeholders, sorry, and the working group also includes um, staff at KFN. And then we've pulled together a broader network of individuals uh, who have keen interest and expertise in the matter. So for example, a representative from the Cycling Coalition, um, folks from North Island College, uh, Island Health, et cetera, to help with that work. So that's underway and we'll be coming back to you in March um, with a draft report. <clears throat> As you know, we were also recipients of grant funding to install some electric vehicle um, chargers. And that is proceeding. We're part of a collaborative with other regional districts on the island uh, and member municipalities have also received um, monies to install chargers. So to that end, there is merit in us looking at um, a strategy around electric vehicle charging infrastructure in our community. And we're hoping to be able to use the installation project as a springboard to have to undertake that work in 2021. Um, the work that we're uh, looking at doing in 2021 is described sort of at high level in the report that's in front of you. And specifically, we'd like to undertake an assessment, uh, retaining a consultant to help us review the various transportation modes and options that might be viable here in the Valley, given our regional profile and characteristics. Um, that will give us something to chew on and it will enable you, I think, to make some informed uh, decisions around what you want the severity's role and every municipality's role to be in building a regional transportation network. We propose um, in the recommendation to host a series of workshops or to develop a series of workshops where the board can start to chew on some of these big issues. We reference transportation certainly, but we also suggest that there's room in the climate change portfolio to have some dedicated time for you to um, delve into priorities and, and create specific work items for staff. And all of this, I think uh, over time we'll see, this could lead us towards implementing uh, development of a regional multimodal transportation plan, which is identified presently in our regional growth strategy as a potential outcome. So Michael, um, James and I are all here to answer any questions that you might have, thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike and Alana. And yes, we do have some questions. Director Hamir. Thank you. Um, and thanks to both of you for your presentation. Really excited to see some of the initiatives and um, um, very supportive of us moving forward on this. Um, just a couple of questions. One from for Mike. Um, 
I'm, I'm recalling that when we had a presentation from um, Ministry of Transport, one of the roads that they um, focused on road works was back road. And so I'm just wondering how that might impact um, the plan for 2021, maybe. And uh, my understanding was this is road works for this year. Um, is there any kind of synergy that could happen if there, the road's being repaved, um, cutouts for like bus stops? I don't know if, if anything like that is possible because the road is quite narrow going through IR1, um, but um, is that a possibility or, or have you been in contact with Modi staff to mm. kind of see what the synergy might be there? Or if there's a blockage, like if they're gonna be doing road works, we might not have, um, transit access? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, through the chair, to the to Director Hamir, we have let MOTI know that we are contemplating uh, some kind of transit service expansion. The timing of our expansion in the back road area would likely be fall, uh, September implementation date. But uh, should the board wish to proceed with this expansion, we would reach out to MOTI and have some more detailed discussions around their project and our and our service expansion and make sure that you know we're we're doing it um, with any kind of synergies that might be possible and hopefully incorporating some of the bus stop infrastructure as part of uh, the work that they're doing there. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> and then my second question, if if I can have one more, um, was for Elena. Um, the active transportation plan. I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure if they were invited or a part of the the committee. But the um, the accessibility committee. I know members have approached me in the past about their concerns with with um, availability of of transit for them. As as you know, transit's one of their major sources of com of movement around. Um, if it's too late, like if if that plan's already written, is there a way to um, refer it to that committee at all for comment or to include them if they have, if there's still time to include them as one of the stakeholders. Thank you, Director Hanier. Through Chair Kettler to the directors. Um, so a couple things I'd, I'd like to note here. When we uh, drafted the request for proposals, we made it very clear that we were looking for a plan that included accessibility. We are looking for a plan that will address the needs of all ages and all abilities in our community. Um, so that's just a, a, an operating principle of the plan that we're moving forward with. On that broader working group that I referenced, we've um, invited and we have received confirmation of participation from um, a representative from the Social Planning Society, as well as our coordinator of our Comox Valley Community Health Network. And I think that both of those individuals are well positioned to provide that important lens on accessibility and what that could mean for folks um, the specific interest around mo mobile access for those with mobility limitations um, coming from the accessibility committee. Certainly anybody can participate in our broader engagement. We're proposing to host two um, virtual open houses, but we can certainly provide uh, an invite or a specific request to a specific member of the Courtney Accessibility Committee. Thank you. Really glad to hear that was on your Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. Um, I do appreciate the report and will support the recommendations. Um, I would like to ask Alana if, um, if you think there's any value in um, linking uh, some of the activities, specifically the um, workshops that you're talking about uh, um, on these issues to sustainability and our sustainability strategy. Uh, we've come under some criticism lately for not uh, making reference to that although it's my position that a lot of the work that is being done under the auspices of the regional growth strategy and other work of this uh, board and staff directly relate. And I'm just wondering if you see an, an opportunity to um, perhaps uh, link in the language uh, that we use to promote these uh, types of um, events and strategies um, to use that uh, 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 sustainability lens. Through Chair Kettler to the directors. Uh, thank you, Director Hillian. Absolutely. So another of the core principles in underpinning that study 
um, is, a, is the GHD emissions reduction lens, knowing that much of our, uh, our, our on-road transportation uh, emissions come from personal vehicle use. So um, certainly that is uh, something that we're having our consultants look at. If we had mode shift, getting more people out of cars, what would be the tangible impact for us in reducing our on-road uh, transportation related emissions? Um, separate but related to this project, when we come back to you with the, um, the RGS, pardon me, the regional growth strategy proposed budget in um, a few short weeks, uh, we'll be talking about how we need we could start looking at community emissions and, and how we can take steps to reduce our community emissions, including transportation. So perhaps a long-winded way of saying is that the plan is absolutely based on principles of sustainability, including uh, GHG emissions reductions, and builds in specific targets uh, that are named in both the sustainability strategy and then reflected in the regional growth strategy. Thanks very much. I do appreciate that. Uh, um, but uh, the main point I think I was trying to make was whether or not we can actually use the, the sustainability language uh, to signal to the community that uh, the work we're doing is building on that uh, significant strategy that was developed by the community uh, at considerable effort. Uh, through Chair Kettler to Director Helene, yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks very much. Director Grieve. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, referring to the, uh, the strategy, um, it was never adopted by the regional district. So even though I attended multiple open houses and whatever in, in every school and every community hall, it was, it was blocked from being adopted. So it definitely falls to the regional growth strategy to implement the uh, the fundamentals of, of the of that strategy because it was it was actually never adopted it was just it was it was one of the things we had to do for the split of the regional districts but uh, we just gave it to the province as being receipt thanks for that clarification alternate director floss uh, through the chair to staff, um, thank you for your summary of your report and I'm really excited to hear about the work and the collaboration that's going on uh, to move towards a regional uh, plan for transfer active transportation. I think there's still uh, time as the, as the Valley continues to develop um, to get ahead of that and I think we're, yeah, it's, it's great to hear all of this work. Uh, one of my, my specific question was just regarding the 3000 hour expansion. Um, when the when the Fifth Street Bridge rehab project takes place, um, do you do you think there's any way to include some incentive for uh, to increase ridership, um, maybe in certain areas of the city, or just to really, you know, uh, give people the nudge to get on the bus and and clear up some traffic there? Yeah, through the chair to Director Floss, uh, definitely there's opportunities to incentivize people during that that project to get on the bus. And I think the biggest one is having those transit priority lanes that will allow the bus to basically zip past the, the cars that are stuck in traffic. And, and that's, I mean, that'll be the big one. Uh, we also have a, a fairly extensive kind of marketing and outreach program that we're planning to do during that time to encourage people to use transit. Um, and I know the city is also looking at some other measures such as park and rides or discounted bus fares. I'm not sure that they'll be able to deliver those, but I know that they have been looking at that and we're going to continue to work with them to, to, you know, support that work that they're doing as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. I think we're still on receipt and it's for the full board. Is there anyone opposed to receipt? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. There's Move one. Hillian and Grant. Is there any further comments on recommendation one? Again, it's the vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed to recommendation one? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. Two. Second. Cole Hamilton and McCollum. And that's for the 3,000 hour expansion. 
Again, a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Move three. Second. Hillian and Floss. And that is for the 600, the 600 hour paratransit expansion. Again, a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that carries. Move four. Second. Second. McCollum and Cole Hamilton. And that is a series of workshops in 2021. Again, a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you very much. We're on to bylaws and resolutions. And the first one is bylaw number 635. Move 635 for first and second reading. Grieve and Grant, thank you. For first and second. And this is a vote of the areas, ABC. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that passes. Move third. Sure. Grieve and Grant for third. A vote of the areas. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that passes. Move six, three, five for adoption. Adoption. Sure. Grieve and Grant for adoption. A vote of the areas. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you very much. We're on to first and second, third readings. So item two is bylaw 630. Move 630, uh, first and second. Sure. Hillian and Grant for first and second reading. It's a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. No third reading. Hillian and Grant for third reading of bylaw number 630. A vote of the full board. Anyone opposed? And that's carried. On to item three, bylaw number 631. King Coho. Second. Second. Grant and McCollum. For first and second, vote of the full board. Anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. Grant and, Grant and Floss for third reading for bylaw 631. A vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. We're on to item four, bylaw number 633. Second. Grant and Hillian for adoption of bylaw 633. It's a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that is carried. Thank you. We're on to item five, bylaw number 634. Move adoption. Second. Hillian and Grieve for adoption of bylaw 634, security issue bylaw. It's a vote of the full board. Is there anyone opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that passes and is adopted. And we will adjourn to in camera. Thanks everyone.